Good evening, everybody. I'm going to call this meeting back to order. Welcome to the council meeting of November 19th, 2018. And please join me for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have um, several sets of minutes tonight. Is there a um, motion to approve the minutes and block? So moved. Moved by Mr. Liverman. Are there any corrections or discussion on the minutes? Is there a second? Second. So it's been moved by Mr. Liverman, seconded by Ms. Braga. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Okay. Wait, all, oh, all minutes pass. Um, next, we come to announcements, and I'll start on my right with Mr. Cohen. Any announcements for this mm, evening? Not this evening. Ms. Howard, Mr. Liverman, Cohen. Uh, just one that, that uh, the uh, Friends of Princeton Open Space are going to be having an opt outside event on Black Friday up at Mountain Lakes House, uh, family fun activities, and of course, uh, Mountain Lakes is uh, easily accessible via the Princeton Bicycle Network. So I think uh, if you look on the FOPOS website for start time, I believe it was 1.30, but I probably shouldn't have said that anyway. No, okay. Okay. Um, now I'm going to be late to pulling these up. So I have a couple announcements. Um, the first is that I'm going to be having my um, monthly Meet the Mayor session um, on Friday, uh, November 30th um, at the library in the morning um, from 8.30 to um, 10 a.m. And I also just want to take this opportunity to thank our uh, police department and public works department and especially our recreation department for their response to um, the storm on Thursday um, a lot of people don't realize this but actually the recreation department was out salting 206 the state highway um, and it was really a all hands on deck um, and I, I just want to thank them for um, for, for chip for chipping in um, and I, I know it was a messy day for, for everybody. Um, uh, but the crews here were working really hard, so I want to thank them for that. Are there any um, staff announcements? No? OK. I, w I did want to read one. Um, Deanna Stockton, who um, is our engineer, is not here tonight. And she sent something out that um, I just wanted to remind everybody about. Um, because there's a lot of road work going on right now. Um, so um, I'm slow pulling this up. Yeah, it's the Cherry Valley Road project um, is going to start on November 26th, weather, weather permitting. In the first phase, Cherry Valley Road will be fully closed. That's closed 24-7 east of Cherry Hill Road to Birchwood Drive, and only residents who live in this section of the roadway and their service providers will be allowed to enter the work area, and through traffic will be detoured. Um, and um, there's more information about this up on the town website. Um, as people are also aware, 206 um, is uh, closed temporarily for the replacement of a culvert. Um, and then in happier announcements, um, we're going to be offering free parking on Sundays starting this Sunday through the duration of the holiday season. Um, it'll be free two-hour parking at the two-hour meters. Okay, um, so now we'll come back to our award of recognition for this evening, and I want to turn it over to Tim Quinn. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I'm pleased that by the luck of the draw, I was selected to present the award of recognition in November, which happens to be Epilepsy Awareness Month. Recently, in an epilepsy support Facebook group, two conversation starters caught my attention. One asked what two things those of us living with epilepsy 
would most like those of you who don't live with epilepsy to know. For me, the most powerful and succinct was from a choral conductor from Australia who wrote, my brain is at war, I am at peace. The next question was what two things we needed most and the near unanimous responses were greater awareness and acceptance and more money for research. These are precisely the reasons I've selected Julie Ramirez for this month's award of recognition. More than three million Americans are living with epilepsy more than MS, cerebral palsy, muscular dystrophy, and Parkinson's disease combined. Yet funding lags far behind other neurological conditions. Of that three million, uh, those three million Americans, roughly two thirds are people like me whose epilepsy is well controlled by medication. We are relatively fortunate uh, ones who only have to deal with side effects which, as the commercial says, do vary, and which I can tell you from personal experience are usually unpleasant. Uh, the other one-third are those for whom medication does not work or works only sporadically or temporarily. For those people, um, they're desperate for a cure. It is a matter of life and death. Indeed, 50,000 Americans die each year from seizures and related causes. Though as common as breast cancer, you're far more likely to see a pink ribbon in October than purple ribbons like the ones my colleagues are wearing uh, in November. That is because epilepsy is mysterious and misunderstood and those who live with it often have to deal with stigma and ignorance. Which brings me back to Julie. Uh, who, whom some of you know as a member of the Citizens Finance Advisory Committee. Her activism, inspired by the experiences of her brother Danny, involves raising both awareness and raising funds. Her work for Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy, founded by President Obama's advisor David Axelrod, is focused foursquare on what those of us living with epilepsy most desire, a cure. Julie is also active online, destigmatizing epilepsy and educating the public that we are not brain damaged, we are just brain different. For this little known advocacy and for her generosity toward research efforts, please join me in applauding Julie Ramirez. try not to cry. <laughs> but yeah, I want to thank Tim for raising awareness um, for epilepsy and for CURE, Citizens United for Research in Epilepsy. Uh, CURE is one of the largest um, private uh, funders of epilepsy research in the world. And um, every day they're making new strides, but um, ultimately, as Tim mentioned, we need a cure. and. Um, I'm getting a little emotional. My brother um, suffered from epilepsy from the time he was three. And um, he was one of the unlucky people that Tim mentioned whose seizures were not controlled. And um, he relied very heavily on a lot of medicine. Um, but yet, you know, he had a strong desire to live independently and um, to have you know, his own life and his own job and, and, and things that all of us sometimes take for granted. And um, my brother passed away a few years ago from an epilepsy-related incident. And um, my dedication to this is, you know, he always, the one thing he wanted was a cure. And um, there are so many people who shouldn't have to suffer the way he did and, um, and, and pass away the way he and, and many of my um, 
friends from Cure's children have. So um, I just want to thank you all for taking a few minutes to listen and to um, hopefully learn something new about epilepsy and be uh, you know, conscious of the struggles that people with epilepsy face um, in their day-to-day -day lives. It's a, sometimes it's a silent kind of illness. It's not always visible. And um, there's a huge stigma, as Tim mentioned. So we need more acceptance, and we, we need a cure. So thank you. Thanks, Julie. And we have two proclamations on the agenda for tonight. Um, the first is Small Business Saturday, um, which is traditionally the Saturday after Thanksgiving, and that's the same this year. Um, it'll be November 24th, 2018, and we encourage everybody to uh, shop local that day and every day. Um, and also there's a proclamation for Communities of Light Day, which is December 3rd, 2018. Um, this is an event put on every year by Women's Space, um, and we certainly support their efforts um, to raise awareness about um, domestic abuse. Um, now we come to the part of the agenda for um, comments from the public for items that are not already on the agenda. Um, there was a sign-up sheet, and we'll start with the people who signed up. Um, and then we'll move on to anybody else who'd like to speak. Um, some of the people here have said zoning. I think everybody actually who signed this sheet, I'm going to hold these names because I think it's more appropriate for you to talk during the public hearing for the um, uh, ordinance public hearing on the neighborhood character. But if there's anybody who'd like to speak to something that's not already on the agenda, I invite you to come up to the mic. Greetings. My name is Raymond DeVoe. I'm the volunteer board chair of Princeton Community Television. I don't want to make anyone nervous because I'm fully aware that we're in ongoing negotiations, so I'm not going to talk about anything specific. But I wanted to just talk for a second on uh, two items of a more general nature. Um, obviously, we were disappointed with Council's interest in reducing the pass-through funding of the public access. Um, uh, franchise fees, but um, I think we come at the dollar per cost per citizen argument from different angles, and it's quite possible that's that's the way it'll have to stay. Um, I think we can still put together a very productive contract agreement, not having to see eye to eye, and I look forward to uh, trying to bring that bring that about. But uh, one thing that is in incontrovertible and uh, not many people are aware is that over the past three years however PCTV has been directly and solely responsible for the upgrade of the Monument Main main conference room to the tune of over seventy thousand dollars this was supposed to be a backup studio which members could reserve on our website and uh, would be complete with an internet trunk line to the station downstairs, with neither of which uh, were afforded to us in the end. But that is $70,000 benefit to the public works, the municipality, and thus the citizenry. Um, the general item number two is that there appears to be a perception among the uh, municipally connected that PCTV has done quote, nothing by way of attempting to secure private funding outside of the franchise fee pass-through from the cable companies. Um, in fiscal year 2017, PCTV raised over 25000 from private sources. I recognize this is no Krausis pot of gold, um, but for an all-volunteer board of five with three and a half employees, it's an amount, in my opinion, to be proud of. For fiscal year 2018, we stand poised to repeat and possibly even exceed that amount. And we have plans to radically increase this amount going forward, which we will be happy to discuss in greater detail in our meetings. 
Um, I just uh, just wanted to bring to light that uh, you know, the constant use of the word nothing was that I take issue with and I felt compelled to refute. Um, I appreciate the uh, chance to address this and have it put into the public record and I look forward to our ongoing conversations. Thank you and have a nice Thanksgiving. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak on any item that's not already on the agenda? All right, seeing no one, I'll close public comment and we'll move on to reports. Our first report tonight is a Griggs Farm update and I'd like to invite up Etricelli from Princeton Community Housing. Hi, good evening, Mayor, Council members, public, members of the public. Thank you for the opportunity to be here tonight. Um, again, I'm Ed Trucelli from Princeton Community Housing. And I wanted to update everyone on the progress of the renovation to uh, one of the buildings at Griggs Farm. As everyone uh, may recall, back on December 27th of last year, we unfortunately had a fire at Griggs Farm um, in one of the buildings and uh, the building was heavily damaged and unfortunately a resident uh, passed away in that fire. Um, I'm happy to report though we had a great outpouring of support from the community and uh, as many of you know we've been able to temporarily uh, house uh, the residents who wish to return to Griggs Farm in other um, rental apartments during the, the past several months and um, I'm also happy to report that the renovation progress uh, is moving along pretty pretty well. Um, after the receipt of the building permits in June uh, of this year, uh, the work began in earnest, and at this point it is expected to be completed by April of 2019. Uh, the Griggs Farm Condo Association is actually leading the effort to restore the building. Uh, we, PCH, Prince of Community Housing, are uh, working hand in hand with the Condo Association, but they have the lead responsibility for restoring the building. Um, at this point, um, much of the major systems have been replaced at the building, especially the center portion of the building uh, where the, the majority of the damage occurred. Um, roof has been replaced, windows, siding, um, some of the interior structure has been replaced. Uh, over the next several months, they'll be focusing on the interiors, uh, including uh, drywall, paint, cabinetry, uh, fixtures and appliances and things like that. So again, uh, the expectation is uh, if all goes well, the work will be done uh, by, by April. So um, if anyone has any questions, I'm happy to try to answer those. Yeah, I guess one question I have is um, for the displaced residents, are, are we keeping track to make sure that everybody has housing through that period? Yes, um, of the 19, I'm sorry, of the 24 households that uh, were displaced, um, 19 are gonna be returning with us. Um, as far as we know, the other households have, have housing, permanent housing, um, but we've been keeping track of, of those folks, those households, and for the most part, they are um, in, a, in a lease arrangement now with another landlord. They will um, work on their own to continue that lease arrangement probably on a month-to-month -month basis until April. Uh, when, again, we expect the building to be ready and then they will return to the building. Okay, great. Are there any other questions from council? No? All right, thank you so much. We appreciate thank, the report. Thank you very much and thank you all for uh, the support during this time. Um, our next report tonight is on the Stony Brook Regional Sewage Authority and I see David Goldfarb. I'd like to invite him up. Good evening, I'm David Goldfarb. I'm proud to be Princeton's representative to the Stony Brook Regional Sewerage Authority. Uh, we've had another successful year. Our job is to treat our Princeton's sewerage as well as sewerage from surrounding communities and we've done it up to a very high standard uh, in a very ethical and relatively frugal manner. There are a few things I wanna to bring to your attention. One is uh, we're about to go through a transition which occurs relatively infrequently at the authority. The longtime director, John Cantorg, is retiring at the end of this year, and the new director will be our current engineer, Antonia Pachola, better known as Tony, and we look forward to working with her. Um, there are a few things I want to bring to your attention, in particular as regards Princeton. 
and the authority. One is that for many years, Princeton recovered its investment in building the authority's uh, uh, infrastructure through a mechanism called the debt service adjustment. Uh, that debt service adjustment expired at the end of 2015. Um, I don't know, Lance, you probably may remember that we had these discussions. Uh, I, re I remember when 2015 seemed like the far distant future, but it has now come and gone. And the consequence is that Princeton is unable to get any sort of connection fee so that as the other communities grow relative to Princeton, which is likely because we're t the other communities are South Brunswick, West Windsor, Pennington, Hopewell, uh, uh, Princeton is not receiving back the investment that we have made. What we can do is we can, we can ask new connections within Princeton to pay, but we can't recover from the other communities. It's a problem, it's not gonna be easy to solve because the only way of solving it is to come to a unanimous agreement with all of the other participating communities. There may come a point where the other communities may be willing to do that in exchange for something that Princeton holds over them. I'm not sure whether or when that may happen, um, but that is something to be aware of. The other thing is that if you look at the rates that uh, Stony Brook has been charging. They've been very, very low, far less than 2% per year for many years, more than 10 years. But the legislature, in its infinite wisdom, has imposed a 2% cap with no ability to bank. And the consequence of that is that the authority is going to be charging 2% every year from now on, whereas we might have charged less. In fact, we would have charged less this year. So Princeton's rates may go up faster than they have in the past. Um, but Princeton's rates in a, are based not only on the authority budget, but also on Princeton's share of the total flows to the authority's treatment plants, which leads me to my pet concern, which is reducing the extraneous flow in Princeton's sewers. Uh, I'm very grateful to the council for having funded the recent study that has enabled us to identify a relatively small area, less than one square mile, that contributes more than half of our extraneous flow. What we need now is a concentrated effort to locate that flow and repair uh, the leaky pipes so that we can reduce the extraneous flow. If you look at Princeton's INI removal program, we had a great deal of success when Bob Huff was in charge of INI removal. He was laser focused, very effective. We really achieved quite a bit of, uh, of, re of reduction in the extraneous flow. Then Bob became the head of the PSOC, had less time to spend. We were somewhat less effective and now Bob is has got a million responsibilities, and obviously, although I'm sure Bob cares very much about I and I removal, he simply doesn't have the capability of focusing the attention that is required. So I'm asking, again, for a uh, commitment to find an engineer who can really focus on this problem. It, the payback is going to be significant. The payback would have been more if it had been done before 2015, but the payback is still significant in reducing our annual uh, charges from Stony Brook. So that, that's the one thing, if you, if you don't get anything else tonight from my presentation, it's the one thing, and that is please find a place in the budget for uh, an INI &I removal engineer. And keep in mind that it's the, practically the only area where Princeton University pays its full share of the cost. Um, so it's not, uh, not spread the usual way. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you. Um, Ms. Howard? I, I, maybe I'm going to say the same, same thing you're going to say, Lance, which is, um, first of all, thank you, David. I think you've set the model for how former elected officials can continue to contribute that 
I hope Lance and I can live up to. It's amazing every year how much you give here. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I'll find my own way of contributing, maybe not the sewage authority, but it, um, it's really amazing what you do, and I hope you'll, it, it's a, we so appreciate how you continue to do this, and you've been such a, a voice. I hope you're gonna continue to stay on. He's, he's not up for reappointment, is he? No? Are you going to continue? I'm, I'm, I've got to be happy to continue. Public, I'm, you'll have to, yeah. you have to check with the authority as to what the expiration is. There's some confusion. But uh, my term actually may be ending, in which case I would very much like to be reappointed. Excellent. <laughs> um, and, and I think you, especially given that when we consolidated, we went from having two votes to one, right? This was one of the interesting um, uh, quirks with consolidation is that our voice, so you have to be that much more powerful as just one seat, right? Um, um, so just can you say more about what, what specifically you mean that you're asking for? You're saying you, you need another FTE, you're saying, or you just need another? We're looking for an individual, an individual to perform the same function that Bob Huff did maybe five, somewhere between five and ten years ago. And that is to be responsible only for finding and removing extraneous flow in our sewer system. It, it, when Bob did it, I mean, I, you can see the charts. I'd be happy to share them with you. When Bob did the job, we saw the results. They were significant, and they have not really continued. I mean, the, the, the flow that was removed is, is still gone, but we have not made additional reductions in extraneous flow since Bob assumed additional responsibilities. So we, we, my request is to find an individual whose job it is to find and remove the extraneous flow. So Bob's not here, but Mark, I hope this is something we can take, because David doesn't often come you know, with requests, so this sounds very serious. And uh, absolutely, I will bring that back, and I'm sure we'll have discussions with Mr. Hoff. Thank you. And, uh, any other questions? Um, Mr. More Hyde. for the sake of the audience, I think I know what extraneous flows are, but could you explain where they come from and how we get rid of them? Sure. The, the, you know, Stony Brook, the, 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 the treatment plant on River Road treats Princeton sewage, what goes down your drain. If that's all it treated, we would be paying significantly less to tr treat the sewage because what, we are tr what comes down your drain is less than half of what comes from Princeton and is treated at the, at the River Road treatment plant. The other, more than 50%, is flow that enters the sewerage collection system either through groundwater in, in, infiltration or through manholes that leak and that's inflow from surface water. We've done a pretty good job at removing the inflow, at least it's, that's my view of things, but we still have a big problem with infiltration. And I think anybody who lives in Princeton is familiar with our groundwater situation. It's very, very difficult to find a place to put the sewers where the groundwater doesn't surround them at some point. So that we, have, we have to make sure that those pipes are absolutely watertight so that the groundwater doesn't leak into the system and then, and then end up at being treated at, at River Road. It's not just expensive, although that's enough of a reason to remove it. It's also not good for the environment. It has to be pumped, it has to be treated, it's, it's just, it's not a good thing. Thank you. All right, thank if, you so much, David. We really appreciate it. If there, if there, I, my pleasure. If there are no other questions, then I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank Heather and especially Lance for the many, many years of service. And I, I hope you discover, as I did, that life is very enjoyable without that burden. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, David. Um, all right, and our last report um, for the evening is the best practices worksheet. I'd like to invite up Sandy Webb, our CFO. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I'll start with saying that this is the ninth consecutive year that we've been required to do this inventory from the State Division of Local Government Services. And one of the things that they look for through this uh, inventory of 61 questions is whether we're going to be subject to losing any of our final payment of state aid. And I'm glad to say again that we're not anywhere near being in that predicament, but uh, what they did this year, um, as opposed to what we did in uh, 2017, 
Last year we had 25 questions, but the state tried, because there were so many questions that were multi-questions within a series of, say, a number one question, may have had two or three questions in it. They tried to break that out a little bit better, and then they ended up with 61 questions. A lot of pushback from the New Jersey Municipal Managers Association and the government finance officers because it, it's overwhelming the number of questions that they had. But that being said, um, some of the things that they looked at were the core competencies, and they looked at things like our website. You know, are we putting things on our website that belong up there? Um, the financial disclosure forms that a lot of people have to fill out, but most importantly, the elected officials. So they wanted to make sure that we were up to date on all of the financial disclosure forms. They looked at a lot of things related specifically to finance in relation to our audit report, were there comments in regards to our budget, did we adopt in time, was our annual debt statement filed, our annual financial statement, were all these documents done on a timely basis. Um, then they also had um, another 40 plus questions of things that touched on blighted property, it touched on the master plan. So between Mark and I, we went through this list and we only had one answer that was prospective, which is looking forward that is something that Mark's planning on working on, which is the blighted properties. Um, but for the most part, everything else was great in the inventory, and this is the annual review that we have to do with the governing body at a public meeting. Okay, great. Are there any questions for Sandy? No. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. And now we'll continue with council reports, and I'll start again on my right with Mr. Cohen. Um, I'd just like to give a brief uh, report from the Public Works Department. We had our um, monthly meeting uh, at lunchtime today and uh, went over a few things that I think are probably of interest to the um, people here in the audience. Uh, first of all, we reviewed progress on the parking changes and actually we're happy to hear that there have been very few complaints. Uh, so if you, as Deanna was saying, if you look at it as a fraction of the uh, total number of uses of the new parking meters, um, it's, it's really minuscule, which suggests that things are going pretty well. We have gotten requests for additional education about it, in particular how to use the, um, the, the mobile phone app. Um, and the Public Works Department is working with the Merchants Association on a poster that would explain more about the system that could be, you know, placed in the windows of establishments throughout town. Uh, the Senior Resource Center is looking at doing some training, um, and I think the library as well, for how to use the mobile phone app. Uh, so we are cognizant of the need to make things even easier and um, all of that sort of in the works. Um, uh, I wanted to mention that, um, and many of you have probably seen that the PFARS uh, construction or um, pre-construction has started in the vicinity of Terhune and Mount Lucas and Valley Road. Um, they're actually hoping to get started with their real construction um, by uh, around the end of this month and have requested that um, one direction of traffic flow on Terhune Road actually be closed uh, for a staging area for them. So it hasn't been actually authorized yet, but that would be the inbound direction. Um, so people who are coming on 206 and wanted to turn onto, onto Terhune to come to the shopping center into town would not, no longer be able to do that. They'd have to come on Cherry Valley and Valley Road. Um, and then just two quick things. Um, Many of us were at the uh, League of Mun Municipalities annual conference last week in Atlantic City, and uh, I was at a couple of pretty interesting uh, work sessions, one of which was about FEMA funding f uh, for uh, relief uh, after extreme climate events. Um, what was interesting was that I learned that you don't actually have to have suffered a loss to, to get some types of funding from FEMA. Um, there is funding that is available for um, creating additional resilience in communities. And, and in fact, the Princeton has taken advantage of that in the past to obtain uh, generators, power generators. But um, we're looking into other types of 
resiliency measures that might be uh, suitable to use to through that program. And I know um, uh, in some of the meetings that I was at regarding the new school buildings, there was talk about could FEMA funding be uh, used to help supply some of that. So that's in the air. Um, and the last thing I'll mention is that um, many of you know that VW had to pay a uh, quite large settlement um, for, uh, you know, uh, um, as compensation for the, um, the emissions fraud that they took place in with their diesel vehicles a few years ago. About $79 million of that is coming to New Jersey, and the state is accepting uh, applications for uh, projects that would help to mitigate um, carbon emissions. And uh, um, through Sustainable Princeton, we've actually submitted an application for about $2.3 million grant to transition um, parts of our municipal fleet, both regular automobiles, um, the freebie buses, and a few public works, heavier trucks. Um, the deadline is going to end uh, at the end of this year, and we should find out sometime early next year whether we get any of that funding, but I just wanted people to be aware. Uh, no reports, but one question related to parking that maybe you can answer or someone else can is, there, uh, why do some of the meters still have the bags on them? I believe the meters that have bags on them are ones where pay stations are taking over for the meters, you know, the kiosk type pay stations. But they just haven't gotten around to removing the heads oh, of the. And what's that? That so that suit imminent or the room? Got it. Yeah, just just briefly, um, the uh, corner house student board had their dodgeball tournament, and this year the police played the fire department, and it turned out very well. Um, everybody had a, well, I think for the police, I believe. <laughs> um, the other thing I wanted to say on April 9th, 2019, the uh, Princeton Alcohol and Drug Alliance will be having an educational forum, uh, and I believe we'll be here in this room, um, in regard to the effects of uh, vaping and uh, marijuana um, and the effects they're having on our, our youth today. So we'll keep you uh, posted. Thank you. Uh, just uh, a couple of quick items from my time at the League of Municipalities. Um, one was I attended a session about downtowns, uh, specifically this was done by people who were talking about special improvement districts specifically, but um, two of the takeaways are we're way ahead of other towns uh, in, in leveraging our downtown. It's sort of the, a lot of communities are realizing that um, experiential downtowns are the way to go. One of the things that was a salient point for us was that uh, the consensus among the panelists was that public spaces uh, for sort of like our Parklet or Heinz Plaza are more important in driving traffic downtown than large events, that they have a greater sustained um, and chance for revisits. If someone has a good experience uh, in a public space, they're likely to come back. The other topic that went across several sessions that I attended was um, marijuana, which the um, legislature, uh, the legislators on a panel I attended said is coming. Um, again, we'll, you know, believe it when we see it. Uh, but the key points there are that right now there are more unanswered questions uh, than there are, there are more questions than answers about the role of municipalities. And under any scenario uh, where personal use marijuana was approved and signed, uh, municipalities would have 180 days to decide whether they wanted to participate uh, by having dispensaries or shops. Uh, so it's coming, but there's still a lot of uh, questions that need to be answered. No reports. No, okay. Um, I have a few reports. 
Um, the first is that the council is about to start the first phases of its goal setting for 2019. And um, we're going to start with um, a few meetings with the chairs of our boards, committees, and commissions that will be open to the public. The first will be on November 27th um, at 8 a.m. And that meeting is going to focus on affordability and budget savings. And it'll be here in the community room. Um, the next one will be on December 4th at 7 p.m. And that will focus on sustainability and wellness. And then there'll be a second part to the meeting that will focus on inclusion and social justice. That will also be in the community room. And then finally, we'll have a meeting on December 11th, also at 7 p.m. Um, and that will focus on user-friendly government. Um, and I would welcome if anybody um, feels like there's issues that the council should be working on for 2019, this is the time to send us emails. Um, we try to sort through all the projects we wanna do and um, put together priorities. And I'm very excited to have um, Dwayne Williamson and Eve Nieder gang join us for those meetings too as the incoming council people. And I think that this might be the first meeting we've had after the election, so I also wanna say congratulations and we look forward to having you up here in January. Um, let's see. Um, I also wanted to mention that the board committee and commission application is up on the town website at princetonnj.gov. If you're interested in serving on a board or commission, this is a really good time of year to apply um, because um, there are several people stepping down um, as their term expires. And so there's several openings. We have openings um, just off the top of my head on the environmental commission, the uh, bike advisory committee, affordable housing board, um, Civil Rights Commission um, and several others. So um, you can go online, you can see a list of all the boards and commissions. Um, we um, are always looking for diverse pool of candidates that represents the town. So um, I encourage you to apply. Um, I also attended the um, New Jersey League of Municipalities Conference. And um, what I recommend is that all of us who were there um, put together a list of some of our takeaways from the sessions we went to. Um, just a couple that I thought were interesting. Um, the town of Summit has um, an interesting arrangement with, um, they go out to bid every year. Right now they have an agreement with Lyft to provide rides to and from their local train station um, because they're having an issue with parking there. Um, and they've been growing it every year. Um, so I, th I thought that was an interesting project they have. Um, also, um, there's a new FCC order that um, is pretty awful for municipalities. It um, preempts local control, and one of the speakers there um, basically described it <coughs> as a $2 trillion giveaway um, to, um, uh, to the mobile companies. Um, so essentially, um, they had some news for that municipalities could use in terms of crafting an ordinance that um, would help protect us. So, and I've talked to Trishka about it, so hopefully we can put something together um, so that we're protected to the degree that we can be. Um, and then finally, um, I forgot to mention under announcements that the annual community Thanksgiving service is going to be uh, Thanksgiving morning at 11 a.m. at the University Chapel. It's an interface service and um, for folks who are in town for Thanksgiving, um, it's a, a really lovely event and I invite you to attend. Are there any staff reports, Mr. Shield? Thank you, Mayor. Um, I want to give one report. Um, our engineer, Deanna Stockton, is taking a much-deserved leave this evening, so I'm um, providing her report for tonight. Uh, I want to give you an update on the uh, parking. Um, as of since November 5th, launch of the parking meters, um, just to give you an idea of the number of transactions that have taken place in that period of time, um, just in the meters and play stations, the coin transactions were 4, um, 46,208. Um, meters and pay stations, credit card transactions were 20,739. Um, we've had over 2,213 um, app transactions and 332 were out of the wallet. Um, in reviewing this data with our consultant from uh, Dixon Resources, she's um, indicated that that is actually a very high response in, in terms of the transactions we've had um, in this period of time. 
Um, ultimately, she expects um, the credit card and coin ratio to change to be 40% um, coins and 60% credit cards, and for the app to go up to about 5%. Um, we've updated the frequently asked questions, um, and that will be posted on the website tomorrow. Um, the following issues, we've been listening closely to um, the issues that our residents, and residents have had. Um, so we've resolved a couple of issues, the Discover and American Express credit card. There were some problems with those that has been corrected. They're now being accepted at the meters. Um, one issue was the prepayment of parking before um, the parking uh, time begins. Um, now beginning at 7 a.m., you can now prepay. Um, at all meters except for the 30-minute meters, you can, only re you can only prepay for 30 minutes at the 30-minute meters. So we've made those corrections. And a, um, there will be an update to the Park Princeton application, new version that will be released next week. Great. And that's why. Thank you. Excuse me, Mayor, if I may. I actually, there was something I wanted to report on. Uh, uh, last week, I had the opportunity to attend uh, the National Association of Latino Elected Officials, and that was uh, for newly elected officials. So myself plus 75 more or more uh, newly elected officials from all over the country uh, that included not just uh, municipal uh, elected officials, but also Congress and uh, Board of Education. And it was a really wonderful opportunity uh, for me uh, that really uh, I wish I had had on day one. Uh, but now I appreciate because I, we covered everything from ethics to making policy uh, to uh, use of social media, including I was told that we cannot, uh, we shouldn't be liking each other's posts uh, because they, that might constitute uh, voting. Is that true? Uh, so, <laughs> we, so we'll tell you, so maybe that's something that we can discuss, uh, but, uh, but it really was something that was uh, for me empowering and, uh, and I, that I, I feel that I picked up some tools that will help me better serve our, our community. Thank you. I just want to, if I can make one, so I'm completely clear, the prepayments will be in effect next week. They're not actually in effect at this time. Okay, great. Okay, so um, now we'll move on um, for the item that I think a lot of you are here for tonight, and that is the ordinance public hearing on ordinance 2018-24, an ordinance by the municipality of Princeton establishing new neighborhood residential zoning standards and amending chapter 17A of the Code of the Borough of Princeton, New Jersey, 1974, and chapter 10B of the Code of the Township of Princeton, New Jersey, 1968. Um, and um, we do have Jim Constantine here from LRK um, who um, was instrumental in, in helping um, put this ordinance together um, and um, we're very proud of um, this effort. Um, this will be the first uh, ordinance that Princeton has um, that includes diagrams and illustrations, which I think um, uh, makes it much easier to understand the intent of it. Um, and certainly when we've been having our discussions, I think it's helped inform our discussions. Um, the goal of this ordinance is to address um, a lot of the concerns all of us have been hearing um, as we talk to folks around town about um, the phenomenon we're seeing of homes being torn down and then what's going in their place is often out of scale and off, out of character with the rest of the neighborhood. Um, so some of the things that are in this ordinance have to do with um, the placement of the garage, the prominence of the front door, um, and other form-based, um, what's called like form-based code that helps to address what makes Princeton so special in so many of our neighborhoods that they're walkable and that there's a relationship between the home and the street. Um, so there, um, what happens when we introduce a ordinance that has to do with land use is that we refer it to the planning board um, the planning board weighs in on it and they give their advice back to council. So I'd like to 
ask David Cohen as one of the representatives on the planning board to report back on the planning board's comments to council on this ordinance. Okay. Well, um, so the planning board was generally very happy with uh, the ordinance just as council was. Um, I guess it's really my role to um, discuss a particular aspect of the um, of the proposed ordinance where there was some disagreement on the part of the planning board with what council had introduced last month. And that has to do, uh, it's section K1, which has to do with non-conforming lots. And um, I should give you a little background as to what council um, uh, introduced last month, just so you can understand the discussion. Um, basically, the section K1 uh, says that non-conforming lots, whether as to area, width, depth, any of the um, characteristics that are required of a lot, can be developed um, either uh, Existing homes can have additions or renovations done without having to go to the zoning board for special permission. Or um, in the case of vacant lots, new construction can be uh, put onto those lots. Um, I, I, I'm sorry, and with existing houses, the wording is they can be either um, have additions, renovations, or they can be reconstructed. So. Uh, that was the language that uh, council introduced last month. When it came to the planning board, there was some concern about um, the language, in particular the um, definition of the words vacant and the word reconstruction, because it was felt that there was some ambiguity with both of those. You know, does reconstruction mean? taking it all the way to the ground and just rebuilding on the same foundation doesn't mean taking it out of the ground and you know starting from scratch. Uh, obviously, if that were the case, it would be not exactly reconstruction. You know, does it have to be the exact design? Can it have minor changes? Can it have major changes? So there were a lot of questions that were raised about reconstruction. And in terms of a vacant lot, you know, what's the definition of a vacant lot? How long do you have to wait? you know, after, I mean, if, if somebody chooses to demolish a structure on a lot, is it not vacant? If there's a shed on the lot, is it not vacant? Those kinds of uh, issues. So the planning board sent back the recommendation to council that it would be better to um, actually remove those two words and basically say that any non-conforming lot as long as the proposed construction, whether it be new construction or additions or renovations, uh, can be done without going to the zoning board. Again, as long as they conform with all other bulk requirements, height, setbacks, floor area ratio, et cetera, that apply in the, in the code. So that was basically the, um, the report from planning board. Okay, thank you, David. Um, so what I recommend, recommend for a process is that um, if there are any questions or any discussion council wants to have at this point, especially about the K-1 section, we can do that now. Then I'd like to open it up um, for the public hearing. Then we'll bring it back to council for final. Yeah, Ms. Lerman. Well, as you know, we received quite a few letters. <laughs> I think all of us did. Uh, Princeton has always been a, a very nice place to live because people aren't afraid to speak their minds. and. I really appreciate that. Um, no matter what they what they say, I enjoy getting the information. Um, one aspect I think that was uh, the same in most of the letters was that there was a fear um, for this ordinance um, passing that we're letting uh, anyone um, knock down a uh, a dwelling or or their, their home without coming through zoning. Whereas if they came through the zoning board, then the neighbors would have, I guess, a say so or they would have a little input into the, what was going to be proposed. And they're, they're, I guess from the rationale is, if you do away with not having them come before zoning, is there another avenue, is there another place that they can express their views in regard to the dwelling being um, de demolished, I would say. Actually, 
I think this is a perfect segue to um, have our council uh, weigh in as well because I think in a way that's the wrong question. It's not whether is there another way that we can have some control, but rather if we send them to the zoning board, do we have any control? So with that. Um, I'll start with that last question. That can you make sure you're right in your mic so everybody can hear you? Is that better? You know what? I'm going to take the other mic because this one keeps, this one's very wobbly. It keeps falling down is the problem. Yeah. I think you just have to, you, your mouth has to be really close to it. How's that? Would you please identify yourself? Trishka Cecil, who's our uh, municipal attorney. Okay. Um, starting with the question that Councilman Cohen just asked. Um, I, I, let me just sort of start at the 30,000 foot level and with how lot area variances work, because that's basically what we're talking about here is, um, uh, well, we're discussing this, th one thing, first of all, we're, we're, talk we, we're discussing this uh, solely in the context of undersized lots, but just keep in mind, this same provision also applies to lots that may be either too shallow or too narrow, but meet the lot area requirements. So don't, I don't want us thinking strictly these are lots that are too small. They might not be. They might have other deficiencies, like just strictly road frontage. But basically, these are lots that don't meet the zone's dimensional requirements. And the whole question, and it's not unique to Princeton, this is throughout New Jersey, do you or don't you grandfather in those types of lots? So what a lot of towns do is they do grandfather them such that if you can comply with all of the other bulk requirements, setbacks, yards, height, et cetera, everything Councilman Cohen listed, all you need is a building permit and a zoning permit. Where they're not grandfathered, then you have to go to the zoning board for a variance because of either the lot area or the other dimensional uh, deficiency. And these arise in the context of isolated lots, so you'll sometimes hear these referred to as isolated lot cases, because obviously if there's more than one undersized lot in common ownership, by law they merge. So you're just talking about isolated lots. Um, when zoning boards are confronted with these types of applications, and I will use lot area because that's the most common one, they're, they're in a difficult spot, because uh, the first question is, can you ever turn them down? Now, you will hear some attorneys who will say, no, you can never turn down a lot area variance application because that's a taking. I think that's uh, overstating it, but it comes very close to the case. When you're dealing with a lot area variance, what boards have to be mindful of, what the courts tell boards to be mindful of is the fact that in denying the variance, you may be depriving the owner of any beneficial use of the property. That's the term that they use. Put more commonly, you're taking the property away from them because you're not allowing them to do anything with it. That's a taking, and in this situation, it's a taking without just compensation, which we all know is unconstitutional. So that doesn't mean every one of these applications has to be approved. There's still a burden of proof. It's on the applicant. But you have to show what are called the positive criteria, that you're going to suffer a hardship if the variance is denied. And then you also have to show that the variance can be granted without substantially impairing the public good uh, or the master plan and the zoning ordinance. So how do you show a hardship? Typically, not uniquely, but typically, what applicants will come in and show either that they offered the property for sale to their neighbors and their neighbors weren't willing to buy the property at a fair and reasonable price, or they tried to buy property to make their lot conforming and they were unable to. If they can show both of those things, I mean, pretty much they've shown, well, I mean, I'm stuck. I can't do anything. My lot's too small and I can't make it any bigger and no one's willing to buy it from me. Now the board has to consider the detriments if it allows that lot to be developed. And this is also where it becomes quite tricky. Again, keep in mind, if you say no, the property owner can do nothing with the property. That could be a taking. So you have to be very mindful. Um, that doesn't mean you can't ever say no, but it's challenging to say no. So then the next question is, OK, can you put conditions? Number one, how much information can you require? Can you make the property owner show you detailed architectural plans and building plans, or just they're going to put up a house and that's all you need to know? 
Um, the answer is yes to both of those <laughs> questions. Um, generally, yeah, you can ask for fairly detailed information because the board has to make specific findings as to what is the negative impact, if any, going to be of the proposed construction. It's hard to make those findings without knowing what's being proposed. But here's the but, because the law in this area is nuanced. If the applicant, in addition to their air issues with the dimensions of the lot, they're also, for instance, going to violate the setback requirement and build too close to the property line. At that point, I would think any board would want very detailed plans. You would want to know how big the house is going to be, how long is that facade going to be, what, what is the impact to the neighbor going to be because it's too close to the property line. And I think in that scenario, a board has a fair amount of leeway in terms of imposing conditions to mitigate any negative impacts because that's always the purpose of a condition, mitigate, minimize a negative impact. On the other hand, if the only issue is with the dimension of the lot, and that house otherwise conforms to every single requirement that's been put in that zoning ordinance, what's the negative impact? Let's say I'm on a 2.9 acre, 99 acre lot in a three acre zone. And so that's it, I'm, I'm off. I'm only off by that tiny, tiny amount. I need the variance, but I comply with every single limitation on size and location that the governing body has imposed, at that point it becomes very challenging for a zoning board to impose conditions and say, well, you've got to make the house smaller. Well, why? I, I'm off by that tiny amount and I comply with every single other requirement the governing body said needed to be in place to mitigate adverse impacts. So what's <coughs> what are the adverse impacts that a condition would be intended to mitigate? So that's sort of the, the gamut. Can a board say no? Yes, but it has to have, be super justified in saying no because the potential outcome of that is a taking. Can a board ever impose conditions? Yes, but the conditions must be reasonable and they must be intended to mitigate or minimize negative impacts, which in turn requires finding that there are negative impacts. Um, and the degree to which you can do that is going to depend each time on the circumstances of that variance, but the more the application conforms to every single requirement other than the dimensional one, the less, the harder it's going to be to find that there are still big adverse impacts that require a lot of conditions. So I hope that helped. I mean, it, it's, it's the magnitude of the deviation. The less it deviates, the less it's going to have an adverse impact. The more it deviates, the more it's going to have an adverse impact, the more you can impose conditions. Questions, sir? <coughs> Ms. Howard? So clarifying questions. Mm -hmm. um, you're talking about the role of the board, but we've removed the board from the process in this I'm language. Sorry? You're talking about the role well, of the board, but if, but you don't, if you don't grandfather, which I think is really what's, what's central to this. So what is... What's the effect if you do grandfather in these pro properties? What's the effect if you don't? But and the language as drafted in our packet that we're As currently drafted, uh, grandfathers in non-conforming lots as long as you meet all... Okay, and by grandfathering in, you mean removes the zoning board role? Correct, yes, I'm sorry. Okay, so yep. you went through all that, but it seems like I mean, that's what my fear is here. If we step back, people feel like the current system is being gamed a lot, and we're trying to build in guardrails to protect, and, and, and in effect, what this language does is remove that guardrail of the zoning board, even though what you're saying is, it's not to say that the zoning board always has the ability to, but it's a guardrail that promotes transparency and, and informing the community, and we're removing that. This language would remove that guardrail. You're removing the guard, yeah. So the one thing that you wouldn't get um, with an application, if the person, if all the person has to do is, is apply for a zoning permit and a building permit, obviously there's no notice to anybody. Yeah, there's no community, there's no transparency. That's what you lose. Community. If right. uh, with a zoning board application, there has to be notice, there has to be public notice of the application. I think what describing what happens at the zoning board with these types of applications, I think my hope was to try to give a sense that of how big that guardrail may or may not actually be. Because okay. I know that there's been, there, a lot of people have said a lot of things and there's been some confusion on this point. Mm -hmm. How much discretion does a zoning board have, right. not have, and I know there's been a lot of stuff flowing out there, so that's what 
I was trying to give you my best opinion on that. I just want to add to that. You know, I've had conversations where people have said that rather than being a guardrail, the zoning process is actually a greater frustration than if there were no zoning process because um, applicants have all the extra work that they have to do even though they know they're going to get granted permission and the resident, the neighbors think that they have an opportunity to improve something when they don't really have an opportunity. So, you know, at first I was in this conversation, I was saying, well, it's kind of like therapy for the neighbors. They may not get to do much, but at least they'll feel better after they get it off their chest. And he said, no, they feel worse because they feel frustrated and stymied by the by this specific zoning process. So I just wanted to throw that in. Are there any other? Yeah, Mr. Quinn. So um, to to quote uh, George Bernard Shaw, um, who said, if all the economists were laid end to end, uh, they would not reach a conclusion. <laughs> I think we're, uh, we're seeing the same thing here from attorneys. So all due respect to all the attorneys out there. I've heard from three attorneys on this. And I think that we, we don't get clarity. And my, first of all, to go back and say that this ordinance is the result of two years worth of really hard work and very thoughtful work by Mr. Constantine and by previous consultants and by the mayor and, and, and Council President Crummiller who couldn't be here. Um, and I honestly, K-1 strikes me as, I know we've tried to take sort of a carrot and stick approach and K-1 strikes me as all carrot and no stick. Um, it, I, I think that in trying to provide relief to homeowners who want to put on a modest addition on a non-conforming lot, um, now they would have to go to the zoning board. Taking that, that piece away and making it easier for them and less costly is, um, is sort of all rolled in with removing that same piece from developers who only intend to tear down a house and build something new. Um, I would, I, I proposed and have had many conversations with, uh, with Mr. Cohen about this point. I'd like to see something that required developers who wanted to tear down houses to come to the zoning board to show how they're going to comply with the, um, with the other areas of the ordinance and allow homeowners to add to their houses. I've been told that that is and is not possible. Um, and again, so, I, so just to name the lawyers that I've heard from, you twice, Jerry Muller, and Walter Bliss, who's in the audience, wrote um, a pretty compelling letter to the editor, and I hope that he'll, um, all three of you I respect. I know you have a lot of knowledge and experience with that MLUL, but I feel like we're not reaching a conclusion here. So, I, I, I think I'll just add that then I think the task before us, if we can't get clarity, is then to err, to decide where, which way we want to err. And I, I, you know, my inclination, I want to, I think we need to hear obviously from the people in the audience is this entire process, as you know, has been about establishing guardrails and trying, and, and, um, and I, I'd rather us be cautious. I mean, and that, that's my inclination, but I think we may not get clarity, and so we're going to have to decide which way we want to lean. And um, to me, the cautious thing to do would be to remove it. I would agree, I would agree to a, a certain extent. Uh, we started down the neighborhood character path, not necessarily to stop teardowns, but uh, to talk more about what to set guidelines for what replaces houses that are torn down. I think that the assumption is that every house can be saved and is worth saving, and I disagree with that. Obviously, there are, there are some houses that just aren't going to make it and are better off um, being torn down. Um, so I think that the public feels that this is an anti-teardown ordinance when it's really a pro 
what replaces teardown ordinance. Just wanted to put that out there. Jim, do you want to add anything before we open it up for the public hearing? No, just if the um, <clears throat> if the council wants. I don't wants, know if your mic is on. Sorry, if if uh, if if the council wants, I could give you a you know a two minute overview on just sort of you know based on what Councilman Quinn just said, basically what this ordinance would do, and I think that might help provide some context for the neighbors. So first. Um, on lots on or homes on lots of half acre or smaller requires that the house face and relate to the street. We have homes that are built that you know you can't even find that front door. So second uh, requires for some articulation of the facade. Um, you can build a home that has a straight wall across the front, straight wall across the side. Those walls after certain distances will have to shift and have a um, project forward or project backwards on both the fronts and the sides. Uh, there's also requirements for a minimum amount of uh, fenestration, windows and doors facing the street and the side walls. Limits on how long you can have a blank wall. Right now, you have homes being built with two and a half story, totally blank side walls, uh, which affects the character of the street when they land in as a new home. Um, so we have those limits on blank walls. Uh, then with regard to um, uh, trying to get some articulation, there's encouragement, uh, incentives to have porches up to 200 square feet projecting off the front of the home. It's uh, obviously uh, one of the defining features of American domestic architecture. Next, the garage is required to be set back uh, a minimum of 16 feet facing the front. There's some other provisions for three-car garages that have to be at the side or the rear. There's some limits on the location and the width of the driveway in the front yard. Right now, that's one of the issues that was raised during the start of this process, yards being paved. There are, um, and there are incentives for pushing the garage even further back on the lot, past the rearmost portion of the home. There are requirements uh, for how to treat a garage if it is forward in what we call the motor court and how that should be oriented and design requirements for that. There's, for smaller lots that have non-conforming setbacks, and these are in the R9 township zone and the R4 borough zone, so we're talking about Witherspoon Jackson neighborhood, the tree streets. If you're on a lot of 60 feet or narrower or 6,000 square feet or less, there's some flexibility allowing for some small alterations or additions if you have non-conforming side yard setbacks and there's some limits, you can basically do a, a room, as I like to say, 15 feet long on the first or second floor. Uh, and that has, uh, there's also provisions that adjusted height to setback ratio on lots 45 feet in width or less because right now most of those lots are non-conforming. And there's standards uh, provided for a whole range of projections from gutters and downspouts to uh, window wells, uh, side stoops that come into homes, all of which are non-conforming on these smaller lots today. And that really goes to housing affordability because those homes that are on those smallest non-conforming lots with the non-conforming setbacks tend to be the most affordable in the community. And then last, uh, there's new provisions for how to measure height from the finished grade or the pre-construction grade, whichever is lower. So this starts to get at the mounding issue that was raised. And then there's a limit on lots half acre or smaller for how high you can raise that finished first floor elevation from grade. So those are just, in, I think, in a highlight, the things that will change with anything that gets built with the adoption of this ordinance. Great. Thank you, Jim. Yep. Ms. Scott. I just have to, I have one other point that I'd like to make before we open it up, which is I, I'm concerned that if we take out this section altogether, the K-1 section, and this goes to the point that Mr. Quinn was, uh, was addressing, that if we take away the relief that we're giving to homeowners who want to make an addition uh, or renovation, then we're actually, if we do that, we're actually encouraging teardowns also. Because I think the way that a lot of the teardowns, and by the way, that's what we have in town right now. The current ordinance 
doesn't give any kind of relief to individual homeowners who want to make a change who have a non a non conforming lot and we've seen a lot of teardowns and the reason is that homeowners in that circumstance are intimidated by the challenge of going for a variance the expense of going for a variance and they throw up their hands and find a developer who will then just tear down the house because they're not intimidated by the zoning variance process. So I think that if we make a change at all, it's important to make a change that preserves the relief for homeowners who are trying to make an addition or renovation. Okay, thanks David. Um, all right, so at this point, I'd like to open up the public hearing. Can I just get a sense of who is interested in speaking tonight? Okay. Um, so we will be using um, the iPad timer there, and I would just ask for um, respect for all the people in this room that you try to keep your remarks to three minutes. Um, and we're going to start um, with the people who signed up on the list, and then we'll open it up to other folks. So I'd like to call up um, Adam Bierman, and then um, after Adam, Derek uh, Broz Brosnia, and then Mary Clerman. Can we ask people to line up so we can make sure we... Hot mic. Yeah. Oh, start. Hi. Hi, I'm speaking for Daniel Harris. Um, so I'm gonna, good evening, Mayor Lampert and members of the Princeton Council. Thank you for allowing Adam to read my statements about the proposed change in the zoning ordinances. A twisted left ankle prevents me from appearing in person. I oppose the new ordinance for all the reasons so eloquently and keenly set forth by Jenny Kerr and Walter Bliss over there. Both of them experienced attorneys with wide knowledge of zoning in Princeton. The ordinance proposed, proposed will accomplish the following. It will exclude various population groups in Princeton from participating in processes of zoning evaluation that affects them directly. Uh, it will thus create an undesirable effect of distrust and deep disappointment in the, in the civic environment, when all of us should be striving for co communal cohesion and cooperation in a time of struggle. Please do not vote for fragmentation. The ordinance will permit hugely undesirable defacements of existing streetscapes by allowing a rise of five feet in permitted building height, thus generating another heavy push towards mega mansions, and as some have rightly predicted, an encouragement to tear down rather than remodel sensitively and creatively. The proposed ordinance works against preserving what is left of Princeton's character. By encouraging teardowns, the proposed ordinance will also lead in a spike to the resale price of the new building when sold with the inevitable trickle-down effect of rising housing costs all throughout Princeton, a town which prides itself on diversity and an inclusionary culture. The number of people who by their presence make Princeton inclusionary and diverse is declining yearly. So please vote, he ends with, please vote against the proposal to the planning board and vote against the ordinance. Thank you, Daniel Harris, 28 Dodds Lane. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to say this with all due respect to everybody who's been involved in drafting this uh, ordinance. I think it's actually misguided extremely. And you guys have all been talking about hypotheticals. Well, I, I have a lot that is 0.495 acres. And I just went through the variance um, process where I was approved to put a new house there. And I'm not sure what's so bad about putting a new home on a lot from a house that was built in 1958 that has zero energy efficiency built into it. If you'd like me to reconstruct it, it would have to be happen from the ground up. So what I, how I see this ordinance is no different than you telling me that I couldn't put a red front door. Now you're telling me where I have to put a garage. You're telling me what type, how many windows I have to put on the front of a building. That's the kind of things you're going to tell me. And I'm trying to understand that. Who comes up with what the character is of a town? Who's, whose idea is that? I'm not sure who decides what's right and what's wrong. Because as I drive around Princeton, there's many different homes 
in this town that, one, aren't going to be updated for several years, so what exactly are you going to do about those? And on top of it, in the neighborhood that I live on in Riverside, my neighbors have 0.5 acres, some have 0.52, some have 0.48. So are you now telling me that my neighbor who has 0.05 acres more than me can now do something, but I can't? So it's just so arbitrary and ridiculous that it's something that you should, you should really just throw away, is what you should do. I mean, there's nothing else to say about it. It's just get rid of it altogether because the thought process that's gone into it doesn't think, doesn't think about things like that, honestly. And I, I'm, again, with all due respect, I just think it's, it's very misguided. Um, and I'd, I'd like to actually understand, if you're willing to answer, who is determining what the character of a neighborhood is. Because Princeton is so different no matter where you go. I mean, I've driven down Riverside and I can see so many different homes just on that street alone. I can answer, but I don't want to get in a back and forth. Sure. So if you are done with your comments, then I'm happy to answer. I mean, I appreciate that, but, and I, I'm not going to go back and forth, but to then, it would seem like that would be a correct answer where it's then just your opinion, right? Because you have no, an answer. No. This, was a, this was a process where we had, we had, dozens of meetings and um, we reached out to um, many of the existing neighborhood groups. We met with um, local architects and developers and it was a, um, one of the more comprehensive efforts that we've done. And I think character is, the main character that I think we're trying to preserve here is a walkable community which is not true in every single neighborhood, and that's why this does not apply to um, the outskirts of town, but it applies to um, the lots that Jim mentioned. I can't remember all of the different zoning areas, but essentially areas where there's sidewalks and where you have that relationship where you want to, um, people want to live in a neighborhood. This is what we've heard from the public where their neighbors have a front door that you can see, as opposed to looking like it's a house for um, for cars, because that changes the character of the neighborhood. So that's the intention behind it. Um, and um, you know, it's when you draft an ordinance, it's hard to get it exactly right for every single situation. And that's why we have a zoning board, because if there are cases where somebody wants to build something that doesn't fit within what's allowed by the ordinance, that's when you go to the zoning board to ask for um, relief there. But that's the process we have. Or, you know, we're somewhat constrained by what the state says, um, and the state really sets out what municipalities can do and what we can regulate. Um, we're responding to this issue with what's happening with building in our neighborhoods. I don't think I've gotten more emails about any other subject on anything. I would say even more than consolidation. Um, and so I think it is a big issue in town um, and people want to see the government trying to respond to it. So have we done it perfectly here? I don't know, but I, I do think that we've, we've given it um, a really good shot in trying to address a lot of the issues that we've heard. Can I just ask you to answer one more question if you don't mind? And, and it's just yeah, about, it's, sure, it's just about how in the same neighborhood, you have lots of different sizes that would conform and not conform, and how you can arbitrarily apply that to neighbors, where a neighbor, one neighbor can do something and another one can't. I think that's arbitrary. Right. Mary, wow, Mary Clerman, <coughs> Harris Road. Uh, I have gone through this, the 50-page ordinance and have se several impressions I'd like to share. I, but I would like to say that I especially appreciate the, the comments of Councilman Tim Quinn in the recognition of the complications that are uh, important to residents. And I also appreciate the value of reducing complications because they are a problem for my neighbors. I know people who have gone for, for adding a porch or a shed or some small thing and have had to spend months and many, many, even thousands of dollars doing this. So the idea that builders should be treated differently from homeowners is, um, I think, worth considering. So my, my concern is, my impression is that 
not the not the change in convocations, but the the change in regulations. <coughs> so, the <coughs> excuse me. So the change in height, for instance, and the change in uh, allowance on lot sizes would have specific effects that would be de detrimental to neighborhoods. It seems to me that they'll encourage houses priced around three million a million dollars or more to be built in middle class neighborhoods and to effectively discourage middle class housing. They would, would encourage develop <coughs> developers and buyers who lean toward larger houses to build or buy in urbanized areas, the old borough. And it may, may increase walkability because they're close to town and shopping. But shopping downtown includes little beyond the restaurants, banks, clothing stores, and offices. For instance, there are no grocers, serious grocers, except at the ends of town. If these goals seem mutually contradictory, to me, I, I do understand that increasing walkability reduces parking problems as it's a primary goal. Would not better mass transit better serve the, co the purpose? And a further question, where would middle class newcomers live? In multifamily units or apartments and condos that are yet to be built and where will those apartments go? The ultimate result seems to be urbanization of central Princeton and preservation of suburban Princeton. Is this the intention? This appears to be a major reinterpretation or revision of the master plan. What relevance does the master plan retain? Is it no longer the mayor's intention to preserve small town character? Or have I misunderstood things correctly? I understood that having a master plan allowed you to have restrictions and to say that there are things that the town permits and, and really wants to encourage. And, and so I'm really surprised to hear that you can say that you can have porches, and you, can, and you must have porches in certain zones, but you can't have height restrictions in other zones. It doesn't make sense to me. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you. Cherry, 24 Dempsey. Um, for myself, and I appreciate very much all the work that's gone into this, and I think the illustrations are really interesting, and I think you've been coping and trying to come up with some really new ideas. My concern is that the zoning board, which I think performs a very, very important function, is not aggressive enough in mitigating the issues and that they need to be more creative. I think the frustration with the community is that they go in with concerns about a project. The developer goes in and says he's gonna have a hardship. And so whatever mitigation comes out of it is really little. And so the public goes home feeling totally bushwhacked. And I've been to many hearings in which that's the case. And I also would like to say in a way that 170 Terhune was a little bit that way for me. Uh, that's a building, a house only a, a couple houses away from me, and I um, teamed with another uh, resident on the other side of that house. We, we got an attorney, and um, we did uh, succeed in getting some mitigation in the whole negotiation process before it actually went to the board. Uh, we got the setbacks put in place, the prevailing setbacks, which was a big improvement. But the bulk of the house is too big. And uh, during the process, the developer did reduce the size of the house a little bit, but not very much. It's very tall. And um, I felt that uh, the conditions that were put on it were extremely routine and not at all creative in trying to make that house fit into the character of the neighborhood. The issue of hardship always comes up. And I think that I frankly would like to see it litigated more, the, what hardship really means, because attorneys keep telling the residents that they have no, uh, no hardship, that the hardship is all on the side of the developer, and that the developer has a lot of hardship. The developer hasn't even bought the lot, they just have an a, um, a option to buy, and so I don't see that they have a lot of hardship in a lot of these situations. Uh, but that came up, of course, in this situation, that the developer would have a lot of hardship. Uh, of course, the developer could have walked away from the lot and wouldn't have had any hardship really at all, except some engineering uh, costs that they had uh, encumbered uh, or incurred at the beginning. So I think personally that the zoning board needs more knowledge of their authority, and they need to be more creative in exercising it. 
and that uh, they uh, create, um, uh, provide a major buffer for the community to try to uh, work out these uh, particular developments one by one. And each one is unique. Uh, the concerns of the, of the um, encircling neighbors is unique. The location of the site is unique. It's topography and everything else. And what happened on this is because the, the, the house is so bulky, and I actually think it's out of the ground more than it should be, uh, it cuts off the sunlight from the neighbor. And I think that's a big loss. So the neighbor sustained this major loss to lose the sunlight in their backyard for a great portion of the day. And, uh, you know, and yet we were told over and over that the only hardship was from the developer's side. So I, I really think that we need some more creative thinking about this. I think you're working on, an, on a problem, and, uh, but I think taking the zoning board out of the formula just takes away a major uh, mitigation factor. I think that they need to be um, uh, encouraged and trained to do better work on the side of mitigation, and I think we would get a lot of better projects out of all this. It's not to say that uh, the, the site shouldn't be developed, the undersized site, uh, both the ones that I've been involved in um, had an existing house on it that did conform, but of course the developer wanted a much bigger house on it and they wanted to make more money. Uh, of course, the, uh, the hardship issue is whether they are making a reasonable amount of money, not whether they can make the maximum amount. It's the word is reasonable. So um, I think that we have a tendency to err on the side of the developer and are not giving enough credence to the concerns of the, of the neighbors. Thank you. Mayor, I'd just like to um, pipe in briefly, not about the legal questions, about what a hardship is, but as you know, I'm very familiar with 170 Terhune, it's right across the street from me, and um, it's a poster child, actually, for what would not be allowed under the new form-based code. I can list, uh, uh, you know, on the fingers of one hand, right off the top of my head, violations, of the new ordinance that that house perpetrated. So I just want to say, you know, in terms of people who are concerned about neighborhood character, that's why we did this. That's why we put this ordinance together, and it is a cure for many of the travesties that have been going on in town for the last I, I think years. we just disagree on whether it would be a cure, so, but we both I, I, agree I'm, on the problem. Yeah, I'm sorry, there's a lot of people who want to speak, so we have to keep moving. Good evening, uh, Mayor and members of council. My name is Walter Bliss. Excuse me. I didn't mean to take that out of its holder. My name is Walter Bliss. I live at 202 Moore Street. Um, uh, yes, I am an attorney, but uh, a longtime resident as well. And in fact, I live in what I consider to be a very vulnerable neighborhood uh, when it comes to construction of oversized houses on undersized lots. Um, houses that have been contorted to meet uh, bulk requirements uh, when in fact the underlying problem is the size of the lot and the lack of maneuverability. But with that said, you know that I, I joined with my colleague and neighbor, Virginia Kerr, another attorney, in uh, writing a letter to the editor which has been shared with you and I would like to make it part of the record. Um, <clears throat> and I will try to remember to submit that uh, when I conclude, which I hope will be briefly. The single biggest concern I have is K-1 and the fact that it surrenders the uh, zoning powers of the municipality to regulate development on uh, undersized lots in particular to prevent the construction of houses that violate the, the, the character, the streetscape uh, of the neighborhood. The and the thing that concerns me most is the representation I've heard repeatedly that am, am you can pull out the mic and just hold it if that's easier. Okay, I am sorry. My my greatest concern uh, is the oft-repeated statement that the zoning board has no power to uh, regulate development on undersized lots through the variance power. In particular, it, it doesn't have the power to deny a variance, uh, a bulk variance. Uh, in fact, 
I think uh, there is clarity on that subject, and I'd like to share it with you. First, the statute itself, the land use law itself, provides that all, all variances and undersized lots have always required variances unless grandfathered. Uh, undersized lots must meet not only positive criteria, which have to do with hardship, as we've mentioned, and I won't belabor that, but they also have to meet negative criteria. Uh, and these are the essential criteria in terms of preserving a neighborhood. And the statute reads, quote, no variance or other relief may be granted under the terms of this section without a showing that such variance or other relief can be granted without substantial detriment to the public good and will not substantially impair the intent and purpose of the zone plan and zoning ordinances. And I submit that oversized houses on undersized lots in neighborhoods, uh, in homogeneous neighborhoods uh, with, a, with a defined neighborhood character uh, and violate these negative uh, criteria. That is, they fail to satisfy the negative criteria. Now, let me read to you if I may, to provide clarity uh, from opinion by Judge Serpentelli, whom you know in other contexts. Judge Serpentelli uh, wrote an opinion known as Dalmeyer versus Lacey Township Board of Adjustment, 219 NJ Super 134. And at page 145, he said, <clears throat> and this case concerned in particular the powers of the zoning board with respect to construction on undersized lots. He said, quote, it must be recognized that the appearance of a house and its relationship to the neighborhood from an aesthetic and economic viewpoint are proper zoning purposes, since the appearance of a house may be related to the character of the district. Therefore, the applicant should submit detailed plans, that is the applicant for a variance uh, for an undersized lot, must submit de detailed plans for the house that demonstrate its compliance with the building code and adequately describe its appearance. If the size and layout of the house would adversely affect the character of the neighborhood, both res with respect to a desirable visual environment and the value of the neighborhood properties, a board may justly conclude that a variance should not be granted for the structure as proposed. That's the key language, for the structure is proposed. Now, the, the zoning board is not ruling that no construction may take place on this lot. It is saying you have come forward with a proposed con construction that violates uh, the principles of zoning and the purposes of zoning, as articulated. Judge Serpentelli continues, quote, the board could then either deny the application or approve it on condition that the proposal be modified to minimize adverse impact. But as mentioned earlier, boards must make full and complete findings predicated upon factual support in the record, end quote. In other words, these cases must be addressed fact, uh, in a fact-sensitive way on a case-by-case -case basis and without a, without a zoning board review um, under the variance powers, there is no such opportunity to review these applications on a case-by-case -case basis. As to the financial burdens on small development proposals, I submit that there can, there can be procedural approaches to simplifying certain kinds of variance applications, but those that would change the character of the neighborhood by inserting into the streetscape a totally outsized uh, structure uh, should be addressed by the zoning board uh, thoroughly. I, I hear a bell, which means I have no doubt long run out of time, so I won't belabor it any further. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Incidentally, I support totally the, the neighborhood character ordinance and concept. Um, I rise simply to ask that you reconsider K-1. Thank you. Thank you. Walter, would you like to submit the, the letter to the record? Yes, I would. <laughs> the, uh, the administrator. My but you do need to return the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Yeah, very Thanks, much. Walter. My name is Virginia Kerr, and I live at 124 Jefferson Road. Um, and I joined Walter in the the letter that he just put in the record. 
Um, I think if our policy is to preserve our small lot neighborhoods and put some controls on the teardown and rebuilding oversized house phenomenon, uh, section K1 of this ordinance should be considered. I think the other provisions of the ordinance are very creative. Um, I think it's possible to put this one on the, the table and reflect upon this issue further um, and maybe wait to see what the experience is with these, we, with these other um, provisions. Um, I want to um, emphasize, as Walter said, that the Zoning Board certainly has the power to review applications for development on non-conforming lots and to impose conditions to help them uh, to see that they, they reflect the character. Although I agree with David that our uh, process in Princeton hasn't always worked this way. Uh, I have personal experience with a teardown across the, the alley from me, um, and, and a variance was granted for that, um, even though a lot of us opposed it. But I must say, though, that even, even though the variance was granted, that experience, I think, provides a good example of why having the variance process in place and involving the neighbors through notice and an opportunity to be heard is valuable. In that instance, this house, this was the Toto house, it had a detached garage uh, facing the alley, and my neighbor uh, to the south had used the apron of that garage for years in order to park in a parking space behind her house. She had no garage. Now, when we got the notice and saw what was going to happen, she realized that that development, they, they tore down the garage, they tore down the house, they could have put a fence all the way around the back property line and it made it absolutely almost impossible for her to to have easy ingress and egress in, uh, to, to the parking space. The result was there was, there was a compromise with the, the attorney and the developer and an easement was granted. And the reason that was, she was able to work that out was because she got notice and an opportunity to participate. If she had not had notice and an opportunity to participate, she would have probably had to go to court to establish that she had a, what's called a prescriptive easement in law on, on that space. So I mean, I think it's a very um, kind of treacherous process just to say, well, let's, let's just exempt these properties from the, the zoning process and let sort of administrative staff take care of it because the administrators really don't know what the experts know about this, the experts being the neighbors who live next door or within 200 feet. Now, I'd like to also just um, point out that the case that Walter read from, Dalmeyer versus Lacey, which was, um, is not a new case, but it's still very good law. And most recently, that case was cited in an opinion called German versus the Township, J-E-R-M-A-N versus the Township of Manchester, which I think is instructive um, in thinking about how communities can approach the problem of undersized lots. In the German case, the Township of Manchester had passed an ordinance to address the building of homes on undersized lots, and what they did was basically establish special rules for undersized lots. And unlike what we're doing, they said that houses on undersized lots could only be one and a half stories high, even though the houses on the regular lots were two and a half stories high. They also required the submission of detailed plans, et cetera, et cetera. A developer sued, saying this, they violated the municipal land use law, they violated the uniformity clause, um, there were a bunch of arguments, and the trial court rejected those arguments, saying this is lawful, and the appellate division affirmed that, um, that ruling, and um, Manchester's planner uh, said the purpose of the ordinance was to establish um, a set of uniform rules and review standards 
consistent with the principle the principles established in Dalmeyer versus Lacey for the development of undersized lot. Um, because the township determined that the building height of two or two and a half story single family homes on such lots was not in character with the rest of the zone. Now I'm not reading this to say this is what you should do. I'm just reading, to set, reading it to sort of establish what um, what the parameters of possibility are for responding to this problem. I don't think it's either, you know, either we uh, abandon the variance process or we sort of stick with what we have, which is problematic. I mean, there are lots of, um, you know, there are, a lot, there, there are a number of things to think about in how to address this, and I think that Section K-1 is um, problematic in many ways. I also agree um, with those who have questioned um, whether we should be raising the height requirement to 35 feet in these neighborhoods. And thank you very much. Thank you. Now I'm going to go off microphone. Hello. I'm Alice Arts, uh, 51 Hawthorne Avenue. Um, I've just been noticing that there are tons and tons of teardowns and huge monstrosities built on tiny little lots, and this is not the Princeton that I grew up in or that I would like to have. Uh, I think that generally Princeton has been bending over backwards, being super nice and super accommodating to all these high-powered developers who come whining about problems one way or the other. And I think it's disgusting. I think we should pay attention to the people who live there, the kinds of houses that they have, you know, the, 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 what we would like to have as our house, you know, not just tear down anything. I have no objection to somebody who wants to put a porch in their house or something like that. They should not have big problems. I remember even when my father, back in the 50s, wanted to build a garage, he couldn't build a two-car garage because there hadn't been a two-car garage there before, so he had to build a one-car garage right on the, the, the foundations that were there already. I think maybe it would have been nice if he could have built a two-car garage. Why not? But that wouldn't have changed anything about the neighbors or about our property, or about what anything looked like. The garage was way in back of the house. Um, so I have no problem with a property owner who's staying put, wants to build a little something or other on his house, that's fine. But these developers that come in and, 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 and just do anything they want to do and then build these monstrosities, I think the zoning board should absolutely uh, not allow that kind of thing. I mean, that just shouldn't happen. So anyway, whatever. I, I think it's disgusting what's going on. Hi, good evening. My name is Galina Chernai, 258 Hawthorne. Um, and I would like to bring up an issue which I haven't heard anyone touching on. And uh, we are talking about revisions to the zoning ordinance. But there is another ordinance, uh, which is also municipal law. And that ordinance, to those in the audience who do not know it, it's called tree protection ordinance. They both are municipal laws. And I have real challenge seeing why one is being uh, followed, whereas the other one, which I keep hearing from engineering, cannot be enforced. And I didn't hear in all these discussions that that was taken into consideration when thinking about revisions to the current one. So the current ordinance, zoning ordinance, and the tree protection ordinance conflict each other. I think that's an established fact, and we all agree with that. So has any action been taken to actually align those ordinances? And today, a lot was talked about the setback. And I will give just very specific example, which I've been living through for the uh, six months of my life. Um, and I wish I didn't have to. Uh, but let's say setback. So I'm told um, zoning code allows a setback of 10 feet from my property line for the house. But if you start thinking about it, what this 10 feet actually means. Here's a 10 feet is the wall of the house, but the house needs service lines. 
And then the construction plan, those service lines are five feet away from the wall. Now do the math. 10 minus five, how much it leaves you? Five. So, okay, now you're five feet away from my property line. Then what I hear is that the engineering tells me, oh, the builder needs room to work. They need at least two, three more feet to work. Okay, continue doing math. Five minus three leaves you two. So what you are finishing with the 10 uh, feet setback is an excavation going 10 to 10, uh, eight to 10 feet deep two feet from your property line. And I happen to have a beautiful maple tree entirely on my property, which is away from the property line, just a few feet. So the engineering signed the death sentence for that tree by approving the um, construction permit, because there is no way that tree can survive if the uh, trench is dug within two feet, not 10 feet, as we are talking about setback, but in actuality is two feet. Who wants to come and actually see how it looks? I will welcome everyone to stop by 258 Hawthorne and take a look at the monstrosity at 260 being raised by RB Homes and those trenches which are still there with all the roots exposed of my, my tree, my property. So I just hope that the council will take this into consideration and whatever revision comes from the uh, currently existing zoning ordinance will actually agree with the tree protection ordinance. And I don't think residents should be hearing something, oh, the builders are okay to, with the uh, zoning ordinance to follow, but the tree protection, no, 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 we cannot do that. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Gail Wurst, and, I, and I'm at 2022 Alexander Street. I believe that the vote on the zoning ordinance should be postponed into the beginning of the new year. Um, while I'm really pleased that we're going forward with this, and I want to thank everybody for all of the hard work and the many hours, the sweat, the, the, the intelligence, the, the research that's gone into this, um, I nevertheless fear that the overriding problem and impression uh, is that the proposed ordinance takes far too much of a cookie cutter approach and may apply standards devised for larger lots to lots that are much smaller in size for which they were never designed or to lots where the aesthetics and character of the neighborhood will be negatively impacted and that this may take place basically by bypassing the zoning board. The specifics of the ordinance were made available to the public just one week ago on the municipal website, and it has incited a great deal of passionate discussion. But above all, it has incited questions and confusion, and I think we've seen a lot of that here tonight. There are many conflicting interpretations and opinions, but the overriding impression again is that the vote is being rushed and that we need more transparency. If possible, I would like to see another public forum where all parties could get together for honest discussion and open questioning before the ordinance is put to a vote. Late in the evening of the week when everybody is busy with Thanksgiving, many people who would like to be here cannot be here because of previous plans or the fact that they are out of work. I'm sorry, <laughs> out of town. Some are out of work too, but out of town. Um, it, this is not the time to decide a vote of this importance. And on an issue that has been going on, has been so contentious and frankly just so expensive in terms of time, energy, and money. Um, if it is not possible to propose the vote, if we must vote yay or nay in block on this tonight, I would hope that the council would vote nay, simply because of all of the things that you have heard here tonight. I also think that we should consider that we have a new council coming, that we could all probably benefit from more time to think about this and to discuss this and to be here at a time when everybody finds it convenient and that the new council members might be given more time to understand what's going on because they are going to have to be the ones who deal with the consequences of this, good or bad, 
with whatever is decided, and maybe we should reflect on whether or not they are the ones who should be making the decision. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just, um, I, I do want to say for the record that what you said is not true. So this was, um, like has been mentioned, it's the result of a two-year process. There have been dozens and dozens of community meetings. Um, I think this year, this is probably the eighth or ninth presentation at a council meeting. To Eve and Dwayne's credit, they've been here at most of those meetings, and so they are very well versed, and they've also been canvassing the community, and can probably be, I mean, I don't want to put words in their mouth, but I think they can probably tell you that this is a really important issue to act on. And one of the concerns we had was starting this conversation. When you put out, you're going to be changing the ordinances. That's when all the applications come in. Because in New Jersey, if somebody files an application, even if the planning board or the zoning board isn't going to hear it until 2019, they're judged on what the rules are when they file that application. We have seen tons of applications coming in. If we say we're going to postpone this till 2019, there is going to be a flood more applications. And so there is a cost, a huge cost, to postponing our work. And we've, we've tried to balance that because we do realize this is a big change. We want to get a lot of community input. We want this to be a community decision. It's not just us. This affects everybody. But if we wait till every single person has come in this room, to it's read the ordinance, then the whole town is going to be changed before we've gotten a chance to do anything. Okay, thank you for that clarification. But it's also true that I myself only became uh, involved um, recently, but it's my understanding from uh, reading the ordinance today that it was only made available on the website. That's also not true. So it was oh. put on the website a several one days week. before our last meeting, which oh, was okay. back in October. And then it was put on the probably the website again when the planning board reviewed it, which was okay. two weeks I, ago. I stand and corrected then it was on also that. on Thank the website you. now. So it's been on the website. And I would say there was a special website put up where it has research from Massachusetts, from California, from Minnesota, okay. from there's we've done tons of research. We've had reports that Jim has issued a report and that's been up on the website for at least the past eight months, I believe. Mm -hmm. So I would say that I don't I strongly object to the fact that we haven't been transparent about this. There have uh, been dozens of articles about it. It's been huge you know, we post about it all the time. It's on the website. If anybody's interested in this then I, I feel like they, they had the opportunity. I don't know how else we can reach out to people to let them know what we're doing. All right, thank you. Thanks. Good evening. My name is Johanna Froelich Swartzentruber. I live at 205 Moore Street, um, which is one of these lovely, charming Princeton neighborhoods that, is, that was built in a homogeneous way and people find very quaint and there's a definite aesthetic to the neighborhood. So it is vulnerable to being damaged by these teardowns and rebuilds that have no um, aesthetic um, care for, for what the neighborhood is, specifically by developers who are out to make money. Um, I wholeheartedly applaud this, uh, the intent of this ordinance and all the work that's gone into it and um, most of the pr provisions, what, what D David Cohen had, had mentioned about all the different um, re restrictions that are being put on to avoid these kinds of monstrosities. Um, I want to add my voice uh, to the people who have um, articulated concern about the K-1 uh, part of it. Um, uh, I'm concerned about the height requirement change, but that's, um, that's more minor. My main objection is, again, the same as almost everybody else, to um, the, the proposal to bypass the zoning board for undersized lots. Um, I do think this will take away a guardrail. Uh, we've heard how the zoning board does have power and does have the, the foundation to to say no and to and to maybe put some restrictions on or or um, deny a proposal so that another proposal can can come that's that's better and also my main concern about that is the notice to the neighbors would not have to be done uh, the way it has been now and I've had personal experience with that with a neighbor a neighborhood house because we had notice we were able to enter into dialogue and and make a change and prevent 
a tear down and rebuild that was being done by a developer with no concern for the aesthetic of the neighborhood. And that's the last point I'd like to make. Um, I, well, I think the zoning board should be involved. Case by case basis is important. Um, I think that the notice to the neighbors is really important because that way you can enter into dialogue with, with something that's about to happen and, and possibly have an impact. Um, but the, the other thing that I've heard uh, this, this evening is that I'm wondering if there can be a difference made between developers that are coming in to make a buck uh, and don't have any care for the neighborhood and neighbors who maybe want to do a little remodel or a little addition and if we could have a differentiation in the process uh, between those two kinds of um, people who are trying to build. Thank you. That's all I have to say. Thank you. I was a little bit confused about the process as to whether you're still calling in people from a list or whether we can step no, forward. No, we've, we've, we've gone through the list already. Thank okay. you for clarifying that. All right, because I, I wasn't on the, uh, the original list. So uh, I'm Maury Cohen, uh, 21 Morgan Place. Um, I've been involved uh, both as a participant and as a spectator in the whole knockdown situation for the last number of years. Um, I wanted to provide a little bit of ground truthing to the comments that my namesake, Mr. Cohen, um, referenced in the early part of this discussion, um, where he described the process of coming before the zoning board um, as a sort of gesture of therapy. Um, I'd like to use a sort of, not, not to disagree completely with that characterization, but um, at least speaking to my own experience and the experience of that of my neighbors, um, we found it as if we were participating in a charade. Um, and I think that that sort of comes through in some of the comments that were made by the predecessor speakers here tonight, um, that um, you, you come before the zoning board um, with, uh, with uh, a sense that um, you're not going to be heard, that uh, you're going to be ushered out of the door as quickly as possible. Um, I don't know how many members of council uh, attend zoning board meetings on a regular basis, but there's a major problem in terms of the decorum of these sessions. Um, I myself have been treated um, rudely and disrespectfully, um, despite the fact that I've conducted myself with the utmost of professionalism. Um, I might also add that I'm a professor of sustainability studies, and so I'm well versed in, uh, in land use law and the matters that come before this committee. Um, and um, was, uh, was in, in, in multiple instances, treated very poorly um, and in quite, quite, quite undemocratically. I mean, it was, it was uh, um, uh, a, a, a rather ugly stain, I think, on the reputation of the community. Um, so um, I think some of the points that were made earlier by other speakers about um, reinforcing the authority of the zoning board um, the first time I appeared before the zoning board, I was summarily defeated by a vote of nine to zero. Uh, last time I came before the zoning board a couple of months ago, uh, on a similar case just down the block from me, a uh, home being designed literally by the same architect using the same design plan, um, the vote went eight to one. So uh, I, I, I consider myself as having made a little bit of progress. Um, but um, uh, to refer back to the, to the, to the mayor's uh, earlier comment about the flood of applications that have been coming in since this issue has been, um, been aired publicly, um, it's, I've never understood why, and maybe there's a, a, a perfectly good legal explanation, I've never understood why it's not possible to declare a moratorium for a short period of time, 60 days, 90 days, where the township just decides it's not going to issue any building permits during that period of time. Um, and um, with that, I'll bring my comments to a close. Yeah, that was the first question I asked, uh, whether we could do that, and was told, unfortunately, no, we couldn't. What's the rationale for that? Um, Why is it moratorium, I mean, a short-term moratorium, not a, a legal or feasible um, because option? Because the, yeah, the, the courts have ruled that a moratorium is illegal. Mayor, one quick point. I think we, we've been told we should not attend zoning board. That, right, just that's so the other you know. thing. Yeah, so this is just, just I mean, I, to explain a that. lot of yeah. you are like super involved, but essentially the zoning board acts in essentially like a judicial capacity. And so as the rule makers, you're not supposed to. It, it, I think that if we and uh, sit in the zoning board meetings, it can look like we're trying to influence the decisions. And 
people only go before the zoning board when they're asking for a variance or essentially like an exception to the ordinances that we've made. So um, well, they, they serve a purpose, but it's very specific. Yeah. I mean, I'm sorry. Which, which is not to discount, it, the point is that we're not there, but it's helpful for us to hear this feedback because it informs how we think about the ordinances that we enact and how the zoning board interprets them. So it, uh, I'm, not dis well, I'm just making the point that you don't see us there because we've been told not to be there. Right. No, not, not, not because we're not interested. Well, I mean, how, seeing the way in which this, um, the council conducts its affairs is, uh, <laughs> is, is night and day in comparison. And I realize that people come before the zoning board um, with a high level of emotional energy, um, as people do here, um, but, and, 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 and that there's um, um, sort of a lot of anxiety over the whole process, but the, the, the zoning board, or at least some key members of the zoning board, um, seem to act in a way that exacerbates that problem rather than tempers it. So that's helpful feedback, because we also, we appoint the members of the zoning board too, right? So, I mean, this is all helpful feedback. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Valerie Haynes, uh, Mount Lucas Road. Um, I wanted to listen to the dialogue tonight. I've been coming to the task force meetings and the neighborhood task force now for a couple of years. I've been listening. I've read the uh, reports of the, the first consultant and again of uh, Jim. Um, and I know how much hard work has gone into this and I know how much concern there is in the community because it's been, you know, I've been hearing it from people I know and my neighbors and myself uh, for years, literally years, uh, the teardown phenomena happened was happening before the uh, crash back in the the Great Recession uh, back in 2008. It slowed down a little bit, but it never completely went away, and it's come back in force. Uh, one of the things that Tim said uh, uh, sort of sparked my brain. He mentioned that the he was talking about the carrots and the sticks. Uh, in this uh, K-1 particular, in that section in particular. I think that the, there is a carrot in the K-1 uh, as it's drafted now, and that is that it encourages people to design something that conforms to the standards that you've set for the particular zone they might be in. So, you know, they, can, they won't exceed the floor area ratio, they will meet the setbacks, they won't be any higher than the building is allowed to be, because if they do that, they can avoid going to the zoning board. I served on the planning board for a year uh, during the transition between consolidation, and what I saw there oftentimes was that the builders who did come before the planning board came in because they knew exactly what the standards were and they designed something that fit those standards. It might be totally out of sync with the rest of the neighborhood. It might be way oversized. It might be offensive to everybody who was sitting up on the board, but we had no basis to deny it because they were conforming. And so I think there's, the, it's the carrot is that you're saying you can skip the zoning board if you conform, but the problem is that conforming produces something that nobody likes. <laughs> so the next step is really having to make some hard decisions about whether what you allow currently is the right thing for the specific zones that, they're, that you're looking at. Because what I've seen and what I've heard from people again and again and again is this sense that something that's allowed, something that conforms, doesn't fit because it's just too big. <laughs> it, just, it just is out of scale. And that's gonna happen to some degree, of course. People aren't buying, building little Cape Cods anymore. People aren't building little, you know, six room ranch houses. But, but there has to be a better, a better uh, design. And I think that so many of the um, steps that you've put into this ordinance are addressing different aspects of that. Not allowing people to elevate the house by mounding up a lot of dirt and then putting the house on top of that and then counting the height from there. And so you, now you've got something that's you know, much higher than <laughs> anything around it. Getting rid of that is great. Uh, you know, trying to avoid the, the uh, snout garage, you know, this, this overwhelming sense of it's all car. 
Uh, sometimes you can't avoid that. Sometimes a lot has a peculiar shape. But there are ways that can be done, and I've seen houses in town where it has been done, and it's, it, it's very well done, and it it's blends in, and it's fine. But so much of what's done is not done thoughtfully. It's just cookie cutter, and I think that's what people are concerned about. But for tonight, I hope you pass this ordinance. I think, you know, there may be fun, you may find that there are things that you can tweak, and as we go through experience, we'll find that there are certain ways, that, you know, language that could be improved upon. But overall, this is terrific. It's a great effort, and it's, it took a long time coming, and I, I think we should do it. I don't think we should wait any longer. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak? Good evening. <laughs> um, my name is Julia Rottenberg. I live at 652 Princeton Kingston Road. And I want to thank everyone for their time to listen. And I want to thank everyone who spoke today. Um, even though I have a strong opinion uh, about the issue, I, from every single person who spoke today, I actually agree with, what, what, with the issues that people raised. Um, and, you know, just for the record, I moved into town just a little over a year ago. I moved from <clears throat> northern Jersey. Um, and the very unique character, uh, you know, people talk about the, the, the houses, this height versus the, that height. But I think what makes Princeton character unique is how diverse it is. I've never in my life seen another town with people from all over the world, um, each and every socioeconomic background, um, different education levels, etc. Had not to go over, <laughs> um, and that's what um, I would like to preserve. Um, as I said before, I heard uh, people raising issues that are valid issues. Uh, next to my house, I don't want to see a house that is two stories higher. That should not happen, and builders should not have any special uh, privileges. Uh, and my trees, beautiful maple trees, should not be uh, destroyed by uh, zoning rule. That makes no sense. Um, but I also think that imposing restrictions on people who um, want to build a house, that, that's not how um, we become more inclusive. That's how we become less inclusive. And to me, this is some sort of uh, discrimination in favoring one group of people versus another. Um, it is just my opinion that um, some people who raise the issues, those are valid issues, and they're actually addressing this ordinance. Some people feel that uh, the um, ordinance introduces new issues, but from what I've re read and from what I understand, this ordinance actually uh, rectifies those issues. Um, so basically, with uh, that said, I hope that this ordinance gets passed today. I think it will be good for everyone, for all the neighborhoods, conforming lots and non-conforming lots. Uh, I do agree with the gentleman who left that if my property is 0.2 or 0.5 acres larger than his, he should not have gone through this grueling uh, zoning uh, variance and approval process. Uh, and I could do same thing that he did with, without going through the same process. So I think it's a random um, think that that just should not be there. If a lot is non-conforming uh, and it's grandfathered and if he is complying with all the bulks, I mean setback is a setback. Uh, I cannot build house on the 50 by 50 lot the same size that I can build a house on the 100 by 100 lot. My uh, house on the 50 by 50 lot will be twice as small, approximate that. I don't actually know all these rules and regulations. Um, but the rule is a rule. Um, I think that uh, um, anyone should be given equal rights and opportunities, whether the person has more means and can afford the five acre lot, or the person has less means and, and can afford 0.47 uh, five lot. 
So I want to thank everyone for their time, and I hope that this ordinance gets passed today. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anybody else who'd like to speak as part of the public hearing? Okay, seeing no one, I'm going to close the public hearing, and um, uh, if my colleagues will indulge me, um, I do have an email from um, Council President Jenny Crummiller, um, who wasn't able to be here tonight um, because she's traveling um, to be with family over Thanksgiving. Uh, so this is what um, Jenny says, I support the ordinance overall, but I strongly urge my colleagues to remove the section K-1 concerning narrow and non-conforming lots that removes the requirement of a zoning board hearing for applications to develop these lots. I support simply removing the section and leaving the regulations regarding non-conforming lots as is, rather than trying to revise it. We all lose out when our neighborhoods lose their old-fashioned character and aesthetic. Princeton is Princeton because it has not changed as fast as other towns, and that is in part because of the vigilance of neighbors and the concerns they inevitably express about changes to individual properties during zoning hearings. It is valuable for the zoning board to hear from people who know the neighborhood best so that the board can, in some cases, reject changes that have only overly negative impacts and, in some cases, impose conditions to mitigate ne negative impacts. While some may argue that smaller non-conforming lots should not require variances because conforming lots do not require variances, in my view, the long-term benefit to the town outweighs the short-term costs and inconvenience of developers or new buyers of non-conforming lots, which are often bought for teardowns. This is especially true because most teardowns result in higher property values. Whether it's an individual buyer or a developer, the result of enlarging a house on a non-conforming lot is the same in that it increases the value and reduces affordability of the individual property. Therefore, it is in the interest of the community as a whole if we are concerned about losing affordability to require a zoning hearing. Um, and that's, um, that's Jenny's word jetting in here. Um, so I would bring it back to council, and I think that um, you know we can have some further discussion. Essentially, process-wise, and Trishka can correct me. I think the options for council tonight um, would either be we have the ordinance introduced as is. We can either take a vote, but it would have to be on the language as it has been introduced, or there can be a motion to um, essentially amend the ordinance and reintroduce it tonight if is that how it would be or no depending on how extensive the changes and I think we're only talking about k1 correct um, what the statute says is that when you are making substantial revisions okay not substantive substantial you have to reintroduce okay you're taking out one very short clause in a very long oh, okay. so we could ordinance. Still I think that you could adopt it tonight even okay. with that change, especially as it's a change that has been like the public knows about it. It's been in the papers. It's been discussed right. in, very, in a lot of detail with the planning board. So I would be comfortable with you adopting tonight even if you were to either revise K-1 or remove it. Only. Okay. All right. That's excellent. Mr. Quinn? So I just a uh, straw poll of my colleagues if there's any any sort of stomach for adding a, a B to K1. So we have K1A. K1B would be any existing single family dwelling on a non conforming lot may not be demolished without a public review by the Zoning Board of Adjustment to show how the applicant will comply with these standards. That's outside of the Zoning Board's jurisdiction, which is defined by state statute. If I, yeah. I have an alternative amendment or revision that I think will accomplish a similar goal. Can you read it slowly? I sure <laughs> will. <laughs> Trishka got it. OK. I'm just give me a second to collect my thoughts, and then I'll read it. I guess basically I'm suggesting striking just the first clause, which says any vacant lot that is non-conforming as to area frontage width or depth may be developed with a permitted single family dwelling. Strike that. 
and just say any existing permitted single family dwelling on a lot that is non-conforming as to area, frontage, width, or depth may be altered or enlarged, providing that all other bulk requirements of this chapter are complied with. I mean, it basically provides relief to homeowners who want to do an addition or an expansion mm -hmm. as long as they meet the bulk requirements and it eliminates the ability, it, it eliminates the gray area of what is a vacant lot, what is reconstruction, um, and, and basically sends them to the zoning board. What's, Ms. Howard? I, I'm sort of looking to some of the other lawyers in the audience to see what they think of that. The, 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 the so I, I think we're trying to get to the same thing, which is not to throw the baby out with a bad seems, water. It seems an too. elegant way from a drafting perspective to take that off because it's talking about no teardowns, but I, you know, I worry drafting on the fly about unintended consequences. If it makes you feel better, that was the change I was going to suggest if you wanted to limit the grandfathering to existing structures that someone is making a change to. I would have done the exact rewording that Councilman Cohen just suggested. Okay. Um, Should have been a lawyer. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, can we open to the audience? Yeah, so I would recommend that, so um, I, I would say just for taking the minutes and keeping track of this conversation, um, I would ask Mr. Cohen to make that as a formal motion and then see if there's a second and then we can open it up and see if there's any additional comment on it. Do you need me to read it again? Do you, do you need it read again or do you know what it is? Just because it's a phrase being cut. Okay, so. Okay. Okay. I move the amendment of section K1 to read any existing permitted single family dwelling on a lot that is non conforming as to area, frontage, width, or depth may be altered or enlarged, provided that all other bulk requirements of this chapter are complied with. So you Perfect. struck the first clause and struck reconstructed. Exactly. Correct. Okay. And is there a second to Mr. Cohen's motion? Okay, it's been seconded by Mr. Liverman. And um, I just want to start by seeing if there are any, there's any discussion from council and then we can see if there's um, additional comments from the public before we bring it back. So Trishka, what does this do if I want to tear down a house? I, I do, I'm not afforded the protection. I would have Correct. to go to the zoning board. Correct. If you're enlarging, if you're y enlarging your house, making changes to your existing house, as long as you conform to everything else, you can go straight for building permits and a zoning permit. If you're building new, then you're going to the zoning board. Then I applaud my colleague, Mr. Cohen, for his. Okay. Uh, what if I want to put a huge thing on the back of my house? If you meet all of the setback requirements, the height limitations, floor area ratio, all the other size yeah. limits in your ordinance, you can just, it can be dealt with administratively. Uh, you have to show as part of your permit applications, obviously, that you fully conform to all of those other requirements, but you don't have to go for a variance in front of the zoning board. But under our current ordinances, you would need to. I would defer to Derek because I know that there are certain grandfathering he's, he's provisions no. in the borough. So there's no change for those? I'm going to let Derek answer okay. that because he knows what the requirements are in the various zones currently. In the former borough, the lots are grandfathered. From 1968 on, any vacant lot was grandfathered really isn't a change for so those. It, I mean, it, except now it, they're not grandfathered for, you'd have to get a variance. Um, in the township, the way it was interpreted was if it was a new house or a teardown, you had to get a variance for a lot area, a lot width, or a lot depth. So now, I mean, there's not a lot of vacant lots in the borough. There's not a lot of vacant lots anywhere, but. We're not talking about a vacant lot, we're talking about like an existing structure. That, there's really, it's been interpreted that they didn't need a variance to expand an existing structure if the lot was non-compliant. So, uh, wait, say that again, it is or is not, sorry. 
it, they don't need a variance. I mean, this clarifies okay. it. I, I, the language was murky. That's not the way I would have interpreted, but that's the way it wasn't interpreted from the township when I started here, so I continue that interpretation. But So this is essentially, I just want to clarify, this is no change from what we have currently. The, the only change is the substance of the rest of the, the ordinance. Correct. All right. So we've, we've excised the part that was the change yes. and restated the current. Yippee. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> that, um, that, that, I mean, it seems like we just neutered the provision then, though. I thought we were trying to get right. I mean, what, so what have we accomplished? Oh, I think the rest of the ordinance is great, but I just want to clarify, we're not really changing. This amendment is basically repealing the provision that was of concern. Right. Okay. I think it's important for us to establish that on the record, right? Yes. And I would like to... And clarifying the, what had been our zoning officer's interpretation of the underlying ordinance, which is that if you are on, an, uh, if you're on a non-conforming lot, an existing structure, as long as you comply with the other requirements, you do not need a variance. Right. Which my understanding from what everybody said is what we're trying to capture because then you're not penalizing the existing People homeowner who, who wants right. to put on a porch or do some other sort of um, change to their property, even if they're on a, a non-conforming lot. Um, all right, I would like to open it up. Um, maybe we don't have to hear from everybody again, but if um, anybody has um, yeah, special expertise or something to say about uh, this discussion, this new part of the discussion, yes, Eve. Uh, Eve Niedergang, 15 Forrester Drive. Uh, really a question for Trishka, just for my own confidence. Um, the word altered cannot be construed to be destroy or tear down? Uh, that was the no, wording? No, I don't, I don't think it can. Um, I don't have, it, you would look to the Uniform Construction Code for a lot of these definitions, and I don't think the, that altered could be mixed up with tearing down. Derek is shaking his head. Derek is agreement. also saying that's not how it would be interpreted. Okay. Then, then I have to commend you on a, a beautiful fix. Thank you. I, I would like to comment that um, I hold in the reserve the potential to re-raise this issue next year. Um, there's a part B of the um, neighborhood character study which is going to look at density and the possibility of introducing two-family dwellings in neighborhoods where they're currently not permitted, um, accessory dwelling units, a lot of things that we're hoping will address the issue of the missing middle. And I think at that time, there may be some version of the grandfathering that will be appropriate in the sense that we may want to encourage teardowns in order to replace single family homes with a two family home that fits in with the character of the neighborhood and so forth. So um, you can relax for a year, but you may be back here uh, then. Thank you very briefly, Walter Bliss again. Uh, although I'm euphoric about the elimination of new construction from K-1, uh, and the temptation is to say, great, let's go with the alternative, uh, I think major alterations and major enlargements of existing structures and non-conforming lots can do the same kind of mischief that we're worried about with new construction. And the real distinction, I think, is between major changes and minor changes there ought to be procedural distinctions as to how the board and zoning board processes the two, but certainly major alterations and major enlargements, I think, should be subject to positive and negative criteria. Um, and thank you for allowing me to comment. Thank you. Uh, Virginia Kerr again. I agree with Walter, and I'd like to add one thing. If you are going to go ahead and change the building height to 35 feet in uh, districts that are now 30 feet, I can imagine you know, people punching out the roofs 
uh, to to raise you know raise the roofs with um, without having to get any kind of variance relief and some of those proposals might look pretty odd depending upon the the streetscape so thank you Mary, Mary Clorman, Harris Road. I'd like to uh, echo Walter's comments and, and just say that what's, what strikes me as an ordinary citizen here is that while you've addressed the issue of complications, which is much to be appreciated, what you don't seem to have addressed is the fact that if you allow a five-foot increase in the height and if you allow narrow setbacks and if you allow bigger buildings on smaller lots, you still got the same problem that we're really objecting to, which is that you're changing the character of what's possible in the neighborhoods. Thank you. Kip Cherry, 24 Dempsey. Uh, I don't really see a major difference between an empty lot and a lot that has a house on it in which you maintain the framing and the foundation. And you say, hey, we've kept the existing house and you just build around it. Uh, so I'm not sure you're changing anything, really. So I, I have a real reservation about this adjustment. And um, my, one of my neighbors uh, rebuilt his house. I don't know why he did it the way he did it, but he went right down to the framing. The only thing he, he saved was the garage. Uh, the framing was reconstructed because he wanted to change the uh, ceiling height. And uh, you know you can do that. So I don't see that you're really changing anything. I think it's just going to be something that the developers work around and they're going to do what they have been doing all along. I, I go back to what I was saying, and that is I think that the zoning board needs more understanding of their authority and their capabilities, and they need to do more to mitigate uh, and to define the conditions of the variances. Thank you. Thank you. I, I just want to ask another clarifying question. So if you are on a non-conforming lot, um, if we were to do completely away with K-1, if you wanted to do anything on your property, would you be required to go before the zoning board? I'm going to again defer to Derek, who knows what the existing provisions are in the two unconsolidated ordinances. You have to use the mic, sorry. Because yeah, the reason I'm turning to Derek is because if this ordinance is silent, it's obviously not overriding anything. So the answer to your question then lies in what's currently on the books, which... R correct. You would have to go for a variance in the township if you uh, wanted to tear down a, a house or... No, that's not what I'm asking. I, so I'm, let's say I, I, my house is on a um, non-conforming lot and I want to add a porch and the porch is conforming, the only thing is that I'm on a lot that's non-conforming. The way it's currently interpreted, and it's interpreted prior to my taking over that position, was you would not need a variance if the porch was complying. Okay. Well, In either my, the borough or the township? Correct. So I, essentially, I, David's, it, the no. way you're interpreting it, David's language is sort of superfluous then. It, no, well, I the, think The David's, question is I what section? David's, what section of the ordinance currently addresses this? There's a section in the ordinance on non-conforming uses. If it's section K-1 and we strike K-1, then the existing language is not going to come back. We have to, I mean, unless the existing rules about non-conforming lots are somewhere else in the ordinance and undisturbed by this revision, then we, we can't just strip it, strip it out. No, I, I think David's language is needed. It clarifies it. I mean, it was interpreted that way um, for 20 years, 30 years, but I think it's better to have what the actual language should be to be interpreted than somebody making a decision. Is, so. is, is there a way to address Walter's concern about major and minor? Well, I mean, what's the negative criteria if you have a complying application? Other than the lot area or the lot depth or the lot width, what's the negative criteria? How do you ascertain that from a public policy point of view? Is it too large? Is it too high? Complies with the code. The fact that their lot may be 10 feet smaller than the required lot area it throws them into a whole other category of review. 
He uh, looks like he may have an idea. <laughs> I. Yeah, it, I think, uh, uh, Councilman Howard, the, the answer to your question in terms of the suggestion that was made by Mr. Bliss, y you can do that. Then you have to come up with a specific definition that you codify of what is a major renovation, what is a minor renovation. That is not something we're doing tonight. That is something that would take a lot of time and draftsmanship, and that would be a major change. And, and I've, I just want, I know I said it already twice, but I just feel like I need to say it again. As soon as we start significantly restricting additions and renovations, we are going to be encouraging more teardowns. I think that's so important for people to realize. So I'm strongly opposed to what Walter is suggesting. I just wanted to respond. Excuse me, this is Walter Bliss again. I wanted to respond to this, to the idea that there's an absence of standards. I think Dahlmeyer versus Lacey Township made clear that notwithstanding compliance with bulk regulations other than lot area frontage and depth and so forth, uh, a, a, uh, uh, a development must, a structure must conform with the aesthetic and uh, of the neighborhood, uh, must be consistent with the character of the neighborhood. Um, when there is a definable character. And I think major alterations and major enlargements uh, pose the same threat or a similar threat to the character of the neighborhood as new construction. If, in fact, there is the intent to develop a large uh, imposing structure that wasn't there before. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think given the time hopefully everybody who wanted to say their piece on this piece has said it and we can bring it back to council and um, uh, I, th I think we have to sort of figure out what we're going to do here so Mr. Cohen could I just make I'd like to address the concern about the height mm -hmm. because several people have raised that issue and nobody's really responded to it um, first of all in the former borough um, the height has actually been decreased because the former height limit was 35 feet, but it was measured to the median height of the roof and not to the roof peak. The definition of roof height has been changed so that it's both in the, both the former borough and the former township, it's to the roof peak. So keeping 35 feet the same in the former borough, we've actually reduced the height limit on the buildings. In the former township, we have increased the height limit by five feet. The rationale for that, I want to explain because we had a lengthy discussion about it. And basically the reason is that if you've got a 30 foot height limit, it's really architecturally unfeasible to do a, an occupiable attic, a live in attic, a walk up attic with real stairs, not a pull down stair. And I could run through the dimensions for you, but I hope you'll take my word for it. So part of the idea, in, a, in addition to creating consistency across former borough and former township zones that are otherwise very similar, and trying to make them similar in all ways so that they could maybe even be consolidated at some point in the future, that was one part of the reasoning. But the other part was to be able to make walk-up attics that would have actually be livable. And there are a couple of benefits to that. One is that that's a very traditional housing style in town. And right now, with a 30-foot limit, we're actually denying the opportunity to create that traditional housing style. Another benefit is the, the floor area does not change. The floor area limit, the floor area ratio does not change. If somebody puts some livable space under a pitched roof, there, the, the footprint of the house will actually shrink. If that's, you know, if you're building to the maximum FAR, and instead of having two floors, you have two and a half floors, you're actually gonna shrink the footprint of the house. You're gonna change the um, apparent mass of the house in a favorable way. And that living space is mostly gonna be hidden up under the roof. You might have some dormers. So it's not something that really, um, impacts negatively on the neighbors. So there was a lot of thought that went into um, allowing that 35 foot height increase, uh, uh, you know, a five foot height increase from 30 feet. And I just wanted to make sure that people understood why we were doing that. 
So you you have to come up to the mic and okay. And then it's almost 10, so I want to... Yeah, Virginia Kerr, and this is just a fact point about my own house, which is 30 feet high, and it has a half story, which is livable. Now, there's, well, there's you know, there, there are eaves and there's storage, but there's a room up there and there's a regular stairway that goes up. It's not even a pull-down stairway. So I'm just saying in, it's not impossible <laughs> with a 30 feet... 30-foot limitation to make that half story usable. Thank you. I'll, I'll come measure your house. I, okay. I, you know, I, let's <laughs> I look forward to that. You might be able to do it with 31, 30. I'm skeptical. Um, so, Mayor, you know, I, I want to make sure we don't lose sight of the fact that we're probably in agreement on the rest of the ordinance and really excited about the culmination of years of work and, as you mentioned, dozens of meetings and incredible consultations. So... We just need to bring this piece to a uh, head. I'm still confused, and I feel like the most prudent course is to remove K-1 for now and um, us to think about um, as part two how we address, but I don't know if there's support for that. I, I, otherwise, I would support uh, Councilman uh, Cohen's uh, amendment that at least um, you know removes the potential for gaming on the vacant lots, um, but I don't know. I would look to my colleagues. Is there... I, I, I can imagine you're not supportive, but um, I, I don't know whether there's support. That, to me, would be the cleanest way for us to move forward to avoid any um, concerns about on-the-fly drafting. So I'll propose that. Any? Um, yeah, I think the, the concern is maybe from our zoning officer that we want to have some sort of K-1 language to clarify the... Well, I mean, no, I... I I don't know if he was concerned. Your point was you're going to continue with what you're doing, which is basically... But I think it's proper to have language that supports what I'm doing, so it's not an interpretive thing. It should be... You should have rules on the books that you follow. If you, you should let people have this ability to put an addition. If you want to come back and talk about major renovations or major additions, we can do that at a, okay. in the next round. And um, so it, it's, and it's your... But I think he's right also. If you, if you start restricting what people can remodel on a house, you're going to see more teardowns and so it's, it's your statement that the, with his amendment, this would just be codifying the current state. Yes, ma'am. And you agree, Jim? Then, and then as part of phase two next year, you guys can take on. <laughs> well, I, I would also recommend, I think we've heard a lot tonight about um, the, the role of the zoning yeah. board and confusion over the role of the zoning board. So I'm, I mean, and I mentioned during reports, we're about to do our priority setting for 2019. And I think it would be worth looking at that um, to see how, you know, are there tools in the toolbox we're not using um, and how, how might those or be Or even used? are there trainings for the members of the board to understand the current state of law and, and, and right? I mean, I, I think we, yeah, we want to have a system where our attorneys are obviously comfortable with the instruction that we're giving, um, but maybe some research about other towns and other yeah, I would just comment that the planning board does have an annual le legal session with right. our planning board attorney where he does education for the planning board members. We hear no applications at that meeting. If the zoning board does not do that currently, they should be doing that, mm -hmm. and that would be a good time to address this sort of question. Right. Yeah, they do do that. Yeah. Great. Okay, um, so we do have that um, David's proposal on the table. Are there any other comments on David's amendment? Mm -hmm. All right. So, in terms of taking a vote, do we do we vote on the amendment, or do we vote on the whole entire ordinance at this point? You could do it either way, given. My suggestion would be vote on the amendment and then adopt the ordinance, either with or without the amendment, depending on the outcome uh, of the okay. vote on the amendment. All right. So I think just because this is an ordinance, I'm going to ask for a roll call vote on this. Yes, and right it has it. been moved and seconded. It was moved by Mr. Cohen and seconded, I believe, by Mr. Liverman. Mm -hmm. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Howard? Yes. Mr. Liverman? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Ms. Fraga? Yes. 
Okay, so the amendment passes by a vote of um, five to zero unanimously. And now is there a um, motion to uh, approve the ordinance so as amended? Moved. So I move it. Moved by Mr. Cohen. Second. Seconded by Ms. Howard. And Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Cohen. Yes. Ms. Howard. Yes. Mr. Liverman. Yes. Mr. Quinn. Yes. Ms. Braga. Yes. Um, and the ordinance also passes unanimously. So I want to thank everybody for coming out tonight. Um, as has been mentioned, this is um, just part one of um, a process that is continuing. Um, so I know there's a lot of interest in this. Um, also, I think that we realize that you know our ordinances are a work in progress. So I think you know a lot of this stuff we'll be taking a look at, see. Um, how it's operating on the ground and revisit if we need to. So um, we do appreciate your feedback um, and thank you for um, coming out tonight and you're welcome to stay too because we're not, we're not done yet. Um, so next on the agenda is an ordinance introduction 2018-25, an ordinance of the Mayor and Council of Princeton amending salaries and compensation of certain personnel of the municipality of Princeton um, is there a motion, um, or actually, yeah, is there a motion to introduce? So moved. So moved by Mr. Liverman, seconded by Ms. Howard. Is, are there, is there any discussion on this ordinance? No. All right. Um, Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Mr. Cohen? Yes. Ms. Howard? Yes. Mr. Liverman? Yes. Mr. Quinn? Yes. Ms. Braga? Yes. And the public hearing for this ordinance will be on December 17th, 2018. Next, we come to our resolutions. First resolution is 18368, resolution authorizing general release as to plaintiff Stephen Riccatello, only in the litigation caption PAP et al. versus Dudak et al. Docket number MER L 1836-13 in the amount of $100,000. Um, and I'd like to turn to Mr. DeShield um, for any explanation of this. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, what you have before you, um, Council, is a settlement with Officer Stephen Riccatello, who along with six other officers initiated a lawsuit in 2013 related to some allegations of discrimination uh, that occurred in the past within the police department. Uh, this settle, uh, re the settlement represents an offer to resolve this matter without further litigation expenses. Uh, this settlement is being done uh, by our insurance carrier um, who concurs with the settlement is the best way to resolve this issue at this time. Um, and we continue to move forward. We're confident in our leadership, our current leadership in the department. Um, and we know that it will, they will continue to facilitate um, positive community and employee relationships in furtherance of their departmental core values. Thank you. Um, is there a motion to approve the resolution? So moved. Second. So moved by Ms. Howard, seconded by Mr. Liverman. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Resolution passes unanimously. Next is 18369, resolution authorizing the extension of the existing contract with Mercer Group International of New Jersey Incorporated for the placement and removal of solid waste dumpsters for one year in 2019 in the amount of $79,000. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Mr. Cohen. Second. Seconded by Mr. Quinn. Any discussion or questions? All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Um, resolution passes unanimously. And next is resolution 18370, resolution authorizing a joint committee to study shared services between the municipality of Princeton and the Princeton School District. Is there a motion to approve? So moved. Moved by Second. Mr. Quinn. Seconded by Ms. Raga. Any um, questions or? I would just say we've lost our crowd, but <laughs> this is a pretty significant resolution <laughs> and uh, we look forward to working with Princeton Public Schools to see if there are ways that we can share services that will both benefit, uh, save money and, uh, and or create greater efficiencies. Great, thank you. All in favor? <laughs> Aye. Aye. Any opposed? All right, resolution passes unanimously, and I'm sure we'll be hearing more about that um, in the months to come. Um, next, we come to a, the consent agenda, which contains items of a routine nature passed by a single vote. Um, are there any items anyone would like removed from the consent agenda? And if not, is there a motion to approve? So, so moved. Moved by Mr. Liverman. Second. Seconded <laughs> by Mr. Cohen. 
All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Consent agenda passes unanimously, and now is our motion to adjourn. So moved. Moved by Mr. Quinn. Second. And seconded by Mr. Cohen. All in favor? Third. Aye. Aye. All right. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you. I want